okay and it's a comparison to modern day art forms is something which has been asked as a question is it all right so we will discuss about them in painting tradition separately see what i'm doing is i have cut it down into political social economic architecture painting okay and sculpture so in total there are nearly six disciplines in each aspect but the thing is okay i will discuss art and culture separately that is architecture sculpture painting i'll discuss separately only the polity society and economy part i'm going to discuss as part of this narrative is it all right okay so art and culture separately we will deal because it is a technical subject we need to know some specifics basics and evolution we have to see that is the reason why i'm going to discuss it separately is it fine now the next one is okay the indus valley civilization which is known as the proto historic period of india so when it comes to the indus valley civilization here too first i will give you a broad okay outlook on what i'm going to discuss sir so first and foremost what i'm going to do is i have divided this also into three dimensions that is polity okay society and economy so three dimensions i'm going to discuss it separately and in the polity part first and foremost we need to discuss about the extent or first we will discuss about the origin of ivc then extent of ivc is the second topic that we are going to discuss the third topic is okay in polity the administrative system of ivc we are going to discuss we are going to discuss the unique aspects of ivc also we are going to discuss okay then apart from the unique aspect the last one is the decline of indus valley civilization we are going to discuss as part of the polity part is it all right okay polity may first origin of ivc second one is extent of ivc third one is administrative system fourth is uniqueness fifth is decline of ivc these are the five sub dimensions of the first part that is polity then after this the second part is the society part society of indus valley civilization we are going to discuss third is the economy of indus valley civilization we are going to discuss separately okay just for you to understand okay so what are we going to discuss just like think of this as a plan for discussion okay first and foremost when it comes to the indus valley civilization see the indus valley civilization is in fact considered to be a forgotten civilization sir because people did not remember about the indus valley civilization okay and only the textual tradition of india it starts from the early vedic period right so the textual tradition of india it starts with the early vedic period and what happened before it was not known to people and it is in fact the indus valley civilization sites they were first excavated in the year 1922 23 sir this is the time period when the sites were excavated in fact when the britishers came into india they thought that the hindu civilization or indian civilization it starts with the early vedic period okay but at that point of time okay just so i'll give you one example in 1870s and 80s okay so the first director general of archaeological survey of india is alexander cunningham sir okay alexander cunningham is the one who first is the director general of archaeological survey of india and this person what he did is he came across the cities of indus valley civilization when he came across these cities he wrongly dated them and considered them to be part of okay the buddhist age so they, he thought that these are or these cities are from the age of buddha and he wrongly dated them and he did not consider them to be prior to the vedic culture is it making sense then after that in 1920 23 period okay a person by the name of john marshall okay i think i talked about him once before john marshall is the one who excavated the indus valley civilization sites with the help of two indian assistants of his who are one is dayaram sahani is one then second one is rd benerji okay with the help of these two people okay so what he did is john marshall he started excavating the sites of indus valley and the first site that they focused upon is the site of harappa okay that is the reason why because it is the first excavated site in the civilization the civilization also gets its name as harappan civilization so it is a convention in archaeology the first excavated sites name is given to the civilization is it clear okay and these people once they excavated the harappan city and they started properly dating the city they came to know that this harappan civilization is much older than okay the vedic culture or vedic civilization se bhi bahut pehle the bolke so they came to an understanding and conclusion on the basis of this then after coming to this conclusion the second thing that he did is john marshall he gave the dating for this civilization as he called this civilization to be 3500 years old 
Okay, 3500 BC is the time that he has given and he said that the civilization existed between 3500 BC to 2750 BC is the time period that he has given. Is it all right, sir? But, okay, this dating system, it was not accepted by many. Later day, a person by the name of Mortimer Wheeler, Mortimer Wheeler, he came into the picture and he is the one who gave the almost exact date of 2500 BC to 1750 BC. Are you understanding the backstory here? Okay, so John Marshall with the help of Dayaram Sahani and Ardi Banerjee, they excavated Harappa. Then thereafter, okay, this person Mortimer Wheeler is the one who gave the exact dating to the Indus Valley civilization, sir. Then, after excavating the first sites, these people, they primarily focused on the sites which are in and around the Indus River, sir. Okay, Indus River in and around Cape places, whatever sites are possible or present, they started excavating them. And primarily because most of the sites are present here, this civilization was given the name of Indus Valley Civilization. Are you getting this, sir? But after India became independent, India became independent with partition of the country. Most of the Indus Valley Civilization sites, they went for Pakistan. Are you understanding this, sir? Then after that, the Indian archaeologists and historians, they did not get access to these sites, sir. And these people, they started excavating the sites which are present in India. And once these people started excavating the sites which are present in India, primarily on the river banks of this Gagar and Hakra river. Okay, Gagar and Hakra river, these people were able to find numerous sites of the Indus Valley Civilization. Contemporarily, same time period, but they are present on a different river bank. And this Gagara, Gagar Hakra river or Gagar Hakra river, it is considered to be the Saraswati river of Indian mythology. You might be knowing about the Saraswati river, the river which disappeared, okay, so in ancient times, okay, it is called as the mythical river of India. This Gagar Hakra is considered to be the mythical river Saraswati and most of the sites which have been excavated post-independence of India, they are present on the river banks of this Gagar Hakra river. Okay, that is the reason why now today this civilization is not just known as Indus civilization, it is known as Sindhu Saraswati civilization. Are you understanding the names, how the convention is changing? First, it is called as Harappa because first site. Then Indus Valley River Bank Pay, most of the sites were excavated, Indus Valley Civilization. Then after that, Gagar Hakra River Belt Pay, many sites were found. Now, they named the Gagar Hakra River as Saraswati and they changed the name of the civilization to Sindhu Saraswati Civilization. Is it making sense? And the Indus Valley Civilization, which was present during that time, okay, or the Sindhu Saraswati Civilization, its a geographical extent was nearly 1.3 million square kilometers sir. in fact it is the largest civilization across the world okay largest extent of civilization is present in indus valley civilization and its extent is nearly 1.3 million square kilometers and its extent is in the north okay in the north of this civilization one second okay in the north this civilization it started at okay this place called manda in jammu and kashmir am i correct sir Yes, north may, the northern extent is Manda in Jammu and Kashmir. The southernmost extent is this city which is known as Daimabad, which is present in Maharashtra. Is it all right? Then, okay, the easternmost part is Alamgirpur, okay, which is present in Uttar Pradesh, okay, and the westernmost extent is Sukta Gendur. Yes, please take it once. Okay, Sukta Gendur is the westernmost extent. Okay, Sukta Gendur is the westernmost extent of the site which is present in the province of Sindh. Is it making sense, sir? Okay, so Sukta Gendor, Alamgirpur, Daimabad and Manda. Okay, so in between this 1.3 million square kilometers is the extent of this civilization, sir. Okay, huge civilization it was. Okay, and along with this extent of the civilization, one more thing that is important about the Indus Valley civilization is when they started excavating the skeletons of this Indus Valley Civilization, it has been found that the Indus Valley Civilization, it constituted mainly four racial types. Okay, not one racial types. In fact, uh, people who belong to four different racial groups, they are the ones who created this Indus Valley Civilization. And of these four racial types, the first and most prominent one is proto austro Okay, all of this information is given there. First, listen to me. Then after that, I will run through the handout too. Two revisions. Okay, don't worry about it. First and most prominent race is Proto-Australoid. The second race which is present is a race which is known as Alpine. Usually, the Alpine is the racial type of people who are residing in mountains. Okay, Alpine means mountains, right? 
So then the third racial type is the Mediterranean element is also present here. Okay, Mediterranean element is also present in Indus Valley civilization. Then along with the Mediterranean element, the fourth racial type is the Mongoloids. Okay, these are the four racial types okay, which are present in the Indus Valley civilization skeletons. Mongoloid is the Chinese kind features. Yes, then Mediterranean is the kind of features which are usually displayed by the Italians of today. Okay, Caucasus, but okay, so they are Italian, they look a little different from the Caucasian. Caucasian are usually very tall, sir. Mediterranean are not so tall, they are medium built. Are you getting this? Then apart from the Mediterranean, third one is Alpine. Okay, so the fourth one is proto australoid These four racial groups together, they created the Indus Valley civilization. Uh, uh, civilization made these four skeletal types are formed. Is it making sense? Then apart from 1.3 million square kilometers, there were numerous urban areas in Indus Valley civilization. Now I will show you the map. Okay, is the map given in the handout? Yes, in the map is given, right? So I will discuss about some prominent sites of Indus Valley civilization. Each site's uniqueness I am going to discuss, which can be asked as a very good prelims question, sir. Is it all right? So let's see this. Sites of Indus Valley civilization first. Okay, so this is the map. Okay, if you can see the map, you can start a list, listing process you can start. Let's start from, okay, west. Okay, can you see the westernmost site that is Sukta Gendor? Can you see the westernmost site, Sukta Gendor on uh, Makaran coast? Okay, so on Makaran coast, can you see Sukta Gendor? This is the westernmost site. Then after this, okay, the next important site of Indus Valley civilization, if you see here, okay, can you see this site called Mehargar? You see Mehargar there? Okay, Mehargar is in fact the link between Neolithic age to Indus Valley civilization. Sir. Okay, please write it down. Mehargar. Can you see Mehargar there? Mehargar is the link between Neolithic age and Indus Valley civilization. Mehargar. Okay, very, very prominent Neolithic site of Northwest India and it provides the link between Indus Valley civilization and okay, so the uh, Neolithic age. And then after this, okay, so the other important sites, can you see here the area of Baluchistan, sir? Yes, okay, in Baluchistan, can you see this province called Kieta? Okay, Kweta is the province, okay, in fact, this is a village site of Indus Valley civilization, write it down. Okay, Kweta is a village site of Indus Valley civilization, village site of Indus Valley civilization. Okay. Can you see the Indus River and Gagar Hakra River? Okay. Can you see both of them are designated here? And now let us have a look at the banks of River Indus. Can you see here this site of Harappa? The first excavated site, Harappa. It is given there, right? Okay. So if you have the handout, you can designate. So Harappa is the next site. Then apart from Harappa, okay, so in fact, uh, there is uh, one site which is known as Sarai Kola. Can you see the Sarai Kola? Okay, so that is in fact a important trading station of Indus Valley Civilization people. Sarai Kola is a trading station. Then apart from Harappa, if you see the river banks of Indus River, okay, here itself, can you see this uh, site of Mohanjadaro? Mohanjadaro, which was considered to be the largest Indus Valley Civilization site before okay the finding of this site which is known as Rakhi Gadi. Where is Rakhi Gadi here? It was supposed to be here. I think it is not designated here. Okay, that is uh, today largest site is Rakhi Gadi, but earlier Mohanjadaro is earlier considered to be the largest site of Indus Valley civilization. Mohanjadaro. Okay, then after Mohanjadaro, okay, the next site which we need to remember is okay, this site which is known as Amri and Kordiji. Okay, these are also two important sites. Amri and Kordiji. Please write them, write them down. Amri and Kordiji. A M R I. Amri is one. Kordiji. And Kordiji. Okay, so these two are okay. See evolution from village to see evolution from village to urban center. Evolution from village to urban center, village to urban center. Then the next one is the city called Chenhudar. 
okay so please write it down chenhu daro it is called as chenhu daro is the next town chenhu daro is chenhu daro is industrial town in ivc industrial town chenhu daro is industrial town in ivc without a citadel without a citadel okay so i'll explain what citadel is later but just write it down without citadel 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 means upper town okay chenhudaro doesn't have any upper town of its own then apart from this the next site of significance for us is is designated here okay can you see this site called kalibangan okay kalibangan can you see kalibangan on the banks of gagar hakra river okay there is this uh, site called kalibangan okay so it is the site of fire altars site of fire altar fire altar means uh, home okay so your egnasthala is there okay egnasthala is called as fire altar and kalibangan is the city of fire altars number 1 it is a city write it down it is a city where we find where we find furrowed land okay furrowed land furrow okay for road land f u r r o w e d okay for road for road land means okay land which is made ready for agriculture okay for road land is present here so for road land is one thing then apart from that after kalibangan okay you write one more city rakhi gadi okay it's not given here but you write it down rakhi gadi r a k h i rakhi gadi g a r i rakhi gadi is the next site it's not given in the map okay it is the largest indus valley civilization site largest <coughs> ivc site okay largest ivc site is rakhi gadi citadel citadel means upper town c i t a d e l citadel no upper town yes okay industrial town is usually full of workers right that is the reason why there is no upper town part of this yes any other question sir yes so are you understanding this okay rakhi gadi is the largest indus valley civilization site okay which is found in haryana of india then apart from that here can you see in gujarat region there is a site called dholavira okay write it down dholavira so this has been given unesco world heritage site tag last year yes dholavira was given last year and it was also asked as a upsc prelims question dholavira is the next site which has unique water management practices dholavira has unique water management practices unique water management practices no it is great bath it has okay there is a ritual system this one had a water harvesting system of its own which contains dams okay then canals all of these things are present in dholavira which has been given as a unesco world heritage tag site last year and has been asked as a question in upsc prelims too then apart from dholavira can you see lothal here okay lothal okay yes okay the world's first artificial dockyard lothal world's first artificial dockyard is present here okay right now indian government has constructed a maritime museum here okay maritime museum is present in lothal okay <clears throat> in fact the world's first artificial dockyard dockyard is the place where ships come and stop right okay, it is like a stage nearby to the ocean are you understanding this sir so here the ships let's suppose this is the stage the ships will come and usually they dock here park are you understanding the world's first artificial dockyard is present in lothal okay so right now we have a maritime museum which is being constructed here maritime museum which is being constructed here then apart from that lothal is known for double barrier sir double barrier what is the meaning of double barrier double barrier double barrier uh, two people are buried together okay so here in the double barrier there is one barrier which is dog man barrier okay because the man was very much attached to the dog or so what they did is they buried the dog along with the man number one dog man burial is present second one is a male female buried together is also present in lothal so many people consider this as the world's first incidence of sati are you understanding this sir okay so double burials are present in lothal that is one uniqueness of this site called lothal 
then apart from Lothal, here in Gujarat itself, you see Rangpur, right? Okay, Rangpur. So, first recorded evidence of rice cultivation is present here. First recorded evidence of rice cultivation in IVC is found here. Rice cultivation in IVC is present in Rangpur. Okay, Rangpur. Okay, so these are the prominent uh, sites of Indus Valley Civilization. Is it all right, sir? Is it making sense? Okay, so this is the story of the various sites of Indus Valley Civilization. Most of the sites and their significance I have dictated here, but more about them we will study. Is it all right? So now, this is the case with uh, this uh, Indus Valley Civilization sites, okay, and these are the most prominent sites of the Indus Valley Civilization, and this is their uniqueness. Now, when it comes to okay, the next aspect of Indus Valley Civilization, okay, first and foremost, we need to study about the origin of Indus Valley Civilization. Okay, origin of Indus Valley Civilization we will study. So, then after discussing the origin, we will discuss the unique characters of Indus Valley Civilization, administration, then decline. So, first and foremost, when it comes to the origin of Indus Valley Civilization, initially many historians, they considered that Indus Valley Civilization has a foreign origin to it. A foreign origin to it. In fact, they felt that okay. So, in fact, Indus Valley civilization say pehle, there was a civilization called Mesopotamian civilization, okay, in Iraq and Iran region. So, right now there are two rivers here which are known as Tigris and Euphrates. Okay, so Tigris and Euphrates river bank may there was a civilization which is known as okay, this is a civilization called <coughs> Mesopotamian civilization, and some people from the Mesopotamian civilization they were in fact. Uh, uh, they were in fact socially boycotted by the society. They migrated to the Indus Valley region and they are the ones who started the Indus Valley Civilization Bulke. There was initially a theory on Indus Valley Civilization. So, this theory is known as foreign origin theory or diffusion theory it is called as. It means that people who came from foreign lands, they are the ones who started this civilization. But the thing is, this civilization, this theory, it is proposed by the person Mortimer Wheeler. Okay, Mortimer Wheeler is the one who proposed this foreign origin theory. So, naturally, here the British man is more interested in proving that India has always been a land of foreigners. Yes, sir. So, that it will give justification for the British rule or over India. Okay, it also gives justification. <coughs> it also says that Indians are not great. In fact, India has become a great nation only because of the foreign immigrants. Yes. So, with this political intention in his mind, this person is the one who proposed this theory, but this theory has been thoroughly disproved, sir. Primarily because Indus Valley Civilization, the second theory is indigenous origin theory. You need to understand this. When it comes to the indigenous origin theory, in fact, okay, initially there was a Neolithic site called Mehargar, sir. And the Mehargar site in Neolithic period is the first Indian village where people started having a sedentary lifestyle. They used to live at one place, they used to cultivate, okay. So, then apart from that, they had a very settled life condition in Mehargar. Then thereafter, apart from Mehargar, in Baluchistan region, there were three villages, Nal, Job, okay, uh, Quetta and uh, what is Kuli. Okay, Nal, Kuli, Job and Quetta. These are the three, four villages cultures which are present in Baluchistan region. And from these four village cultures, what happened is, some people, they started migrating to the river banks of Indus Valley. So, Balochistan is present in high mountains, sir. You do not have agricultural prosperity there. Because of which some people from these villages, it is clearly proved archaeologically that these people, they migrated to the Indus Valley. Once they migrated to the Indus Valley, they were able to take advantage of the fertile plains of Indus Valley civilization and they were able to produce agricultural surplus. Okay, agricultural surplus means what? What is the meaning of agricultural surplus? Uh, more than what is required for the people who are producing. Are you getting this, sir? Only when people can produce more agricultural produce than what is consumed by them, that will form the basis or origin for okay, urban civilization, sir. Yes, sir no? Okay, because in urban areas, what is the typical def definition of an urban area? What is an urban area according to census of India? See, first there is a population criteria, which means that there should be more than 
5,000 people in any given settlement. Okay, that is one criteria. Yes. See, the second important criteria or most important criteria is in order to designate any area as an urban area, 75% of the male population in this area, it should be involved in non-agricultural activities. Are you following this, sir? First criteria is what? There should be more than 5,000 people. Second criteria is nearly 75% of the male population in these 5,000 people, they should be involved in non-agricultural pursuits. Then apart from that, the density of the area, it should be somewhere around 400 per square kilometer, then it is considered as an urban area. Is it clear? Once these farmers migrated from okay, the mountains of Balochistan to the plains of Indus Valley, these people were able to produce so much agricultural surplus that many people in the society, they need not get involved in agriculture, sir. And these people who are freed from the burden of agricultural production, these are the people who started focusing on secondary and tertiary sector because of which the economic growth, it started in Indus Valley civilization, which led to urbanization. Are you understanding the evolution here? So first, okay, Mehargar, Neolithic site. Then after that, the villages of Baluchistan. From there, the farmers migrated to the Indus Valley and there they were able to produce agricultural surplus and this agricultural surplus, it formed the basis for evolution of Indus Valley civilization. Is it all right, sir? Okay, is it making sense? And this theory, it has been proved clearly, okay, by archaeological evidence that Indus Valley civilization is not a foreign origin uh, civilization. It has a domestic origin from villages to urban areas. Is it all right, sir? Making sense what I am trying to say? See, if uh, it was directly a thing which has been established by the Mesopotamians, there is no need for villages, right? Directly they could have gone for urban civilization. But we see clear evolution from villages to urban areas, number one. Then, if it is started by the people of Mesopotamia, they should have same language. Yes or no? But the Mesopotamian language and the Indus Valley civilization people's language is completely distinct. They are not the same. Second one. Are you understanding this, sir? And the third one is the Mesopotamian civilization is primarily a canal based civilization. Whereas Indus Valley civilization people, they did not construct any canals of their own. Script difference is there. Canals are not there. Then apart from that, this indigenous evolution is clearly proved. This proves beyond doubt that Indus Valley civilization is a handiwork of Indians or the people who belong to the Indian subcontinent, but not any outsiders, sir. Is it making sense? So this is the first theory that is origin theory of Indus Valley civilization. Is it making sense? Yes, sir. No, canals is not present in IVC. Okay, extensive canal building like Mesopotamia is not present in IVC. Canal irrigation, see canal construction means brick canals, sir. Okay, so usually uh, drawing water from a main source of river to the farm is, okay, usually not considered as a canal. Okay, canals are huge brick built structures which are present in Mesopotamia. They are absent in Indus Valley civilization. This can be asked as a very good prelims question. See, usually they ask in Indus Valley Civilization every year without fail, almost one question will come. That two very technical and specific question they will ask. Okay, one area that I am focusing on here is there is no canal cultivation, canal based cultivation or canals in Indus Valley Civilization. Whereas in Mesopotamian Civilization, it is based on canal based cultivation. Is it making sense what I am trying to say? Yes. And this indigenous origin. We can see the indigenous origin here directly. Okay, so these are the three differences between Mesopotamian civilization and Indus Valley civilization. Is it all right, sir? Now, <clears throat> apart from these three differences, the next thing about okay, the origin of Indus Valley civilization, okay, this is, debate is settled. Now, everyone agrees that it is in fact indigenous origin only and there is no foreign origin to Indus Valley civilization. Is it all right? Now, the second aspect that we need to discuss is the unique aspects of Indus Valley civilization we will discuss, sir. Okay, second aspect, unique aspects of Indus Valley civilization. First and foremost, it is an urban civilization where predominant amount of people are involved in secondary and tertiary sectors rather than in primary sector, urban civilization number one. Second one is Indus Valley civilization is known for its uniformity. Sir. It means that across the 1.3 million square kilometers it was present in, there is a tremendous amount of uniformity. Every city, the architectural plan, the construction style is exactly the same. Are you following what I am trying to say? Usually the architectural plan of Indus Valley civilization is, okay, the cities are divided usually into two parts. Sir. One is the upper town, the second one is lower town. 
every city it has the two part classification usually the upper town is also known as citadel okay the upper town is known as citadel and the second part is called as lower town every city it has two parts except for chengudar which is the industrial city all other cities have two parts to them and usually the city it has a pattern which is known as grid like pattern okay this is the pattern of the city grid like means what exactly at right angles the roads are usually cut is it clear sir grid like pattern it is called as and usually the houses are built okay inside of these grids this are you understanding this okay <clears throat> and across the civilization we don't see or find evidence of any encroachment onto the roads okay everywhere people were following very strict discipline and none of them encroached on the roads and the houses were built in a very proper format in this grid like structure sir okay so which is in fact more advanced than today's india yes or no because street encroachment is a common problem in india many people can't start constructing their houses okay extend their halls into the roads okay this kind of encroachments are present but here there is no encroachment at all at any place sir okay that is the second important thing and across the civilization of 1.3 million square kilometers every house is built with bricks which are of the standard format which is known as 1 is to 2 is to 4 format everywhere the brick size is exactly the same okay 1 is to 2 is to 4 then apart from this brick size being uniform all the bricks which were used here in indus valley civilization are baked bricks that is the reason why it has survived till now okay baked bricks means what okay you create clay mold then after that you are going to heat the bricks at a particular temperature so that they will become very strong right all the moisture is removed right now also we follow the baking of bricks system yes see most of the civilizations across the world they were either built in stone or sun dried bricks sir but sun dried bricks they are not strong enough to sustain for quite long a period of time whereas the baked bricks if they are baked properly they can sustain for thousands of years and the survival of the indus valley civilization cities is primarily because of this 1 is to 2 is to 4 break the brick style, sir. Is it alright? In fact, the bricks were so good, initially when the Britishers in 1850s were laying railway lines in Punjab region. These people, the contractors who are building these railway lines, they considered the big quality to be too good and they in fact completely destroyed many cities of Indus Valley Civilization and they moved the bricks from these sides to the railway uh, zones or to the railway lines, they moved the bricks. Are you understanding the bricks which were made nearly 4,500 years ago? They were used for construction of railways, okay, in modern day Punjab. Are you following what I am trying to say? Okay, so then apart from that, many people, whenever they were constructing houses in Punjab, they used to consider this as, okay, brick, okay, quarries. They used to go there, pick the bricks that they want, okay, before the conservation of these sites. So, this way, many cities in Indus Valley Civilization, they have been completely destroyed during the British time. Are you following what I am trying to say? So, this is one more thing. Then, apart from this grid like pattern, every Indus Valley civilization city, it is in fact completely fortified, sir. Okay, completely fortified, okay, with the huge walls are constructed, and every fort it has a unique system which is known as bastion. I will draw the bastions for you. I think you might have seen them on many fort walls. Okay, these are known as bastions. Have you seen them on fort walls? Yes, okay, these vertical projections are called bastions. Are you getting this, sir? Okay, defense plus attack can be done through bastions, right? Are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Okay, usually on fort walls, every fort wall has a bastion of its own. Is it all right? Then, apart from this, in Indus Valley Civilization, in with respect to the uniformity, one more thing is, okay, every city, it has a very well developed drainage system of its own because of this well built city planning the drainage system is also very good sir so in fact the drainage system it proves that the indus valley civilization people they are very much concerned about sanitation yes sanitation is in fact a very important ideal for them every house in indus valley civilization it used to have a private washroom of its own okay one more inspiration for swachh bharat is this are you getting what i'm trying to say private washroom of its own and apart from having a private washroom Whatever waste is collected in the washroom, it used to go into public drains, sir. And the public drains are also not open drains. All of them are closed drains. Even though they run parallel to the street, you don't find any open drain at any place. All of them are covered with loose stones. 
so that whenever any obstruction is there, the stones can be lifted and regularly the municipal authorities they used to clean these wastes. Are you getting? Okay, in fact, just beside the drain, you see heaps of waste, dried waste. Okay, when the archaeologists started excavating these things, they found these heaps. It means that there is a municipal administration which is functioning, which is in fact cleaning the drains regularly. Are you getting this, sir? And regularly for these drains at regular intervals, there are some large pits which are there, which are known as cesspool pits. You know about the cesspool pits? Okay, cesspool pits means all the solid waste will get accumulated at one place and the water will flow off, and the cesspits can be cleaned regularly. So, this way, cesspits are also present in Indus Valley civilization. That is one more unique thing about them. Then, every street which is constructed in Indus Valley civilization, it used to have its own unique watch and ward system. I will show the image later in architecture, but you write it down. Watch and ward system. Okay, For every street, at the corner of the street, these people used to construct two huge towers. Okay, and on towers, there was okay, this public fire or public lights were present here. Watch and ward, W-A-R-T, watch and ward system. So, for at every street corner, okay, what these people did is they constructed high towers on top of which there are places in order to lit fire. Aren't this similar to the street lights? Okay, so this is in fact a concern for safety of people. Okay, night travel also it facilitates. Yes, and on top of every watch tower, okay, so two sides of the street this will be present. There will be a place for a watchman to sit on every street top. Are you understanding? In fact, this has been asked as a UPSC mains question, sir. Okay, what can we learn from the Indus Valley Civilization's urban planning to today's urban planning is the question. Okay, what can we learn? We can learn safety. That is a major concern in most of the cities in India. We can learn sanitation. That is a major concern. No encroachment. Yes. Then well-planned city with grid-like pattern. Okay, in fact, Bhuvaneshwar is also a grid-like pattern city. Yes or no? Okay, so all the roads are planned prior and then the city is built. Yes or no? So, that is also can be seen here. No encroachments are there. Okay, watch and ward system is there. Every house has a private okay, washroom of its own. Yes. And in most of the Indus Valley civilization sites, the buildings are green buildings. Sir. What is the meaning of a green building? You might have studied in environment, green building. What is a green building means? Okay, usually the building is okay having natural okay uh, light, natural wind flow. Yes or no? So, in fact, in Indus Valley Civilization, if you see, every house is built around a central courtyard, sir. Okay, the house will have a central courtyard first and around it, the rooms will be built. Okay, courtyard will have an open top. You might have seen some old village houses, okay, with a central courtyard at center and around the houses are or the rooms are built. So, all the Indus Valley Civilization uh, buildings, they are having the central courtyard system. This is in fact very easy for okay the air, okay, water and sunlight to get in. Yes, can, can we not consider this as a green building, sir? We can learn from this green building concept also. No need to depend on artificial cooling, okay, artificial light in inside the classroom or whatever room is there. Are you following what I'm trying to say? So, this way, natural building concept or green building concept is also followed by them. Is it making sense? So, this way the Indus Valley Civilization's most unique aspect is its uniformity and urban planning, sir. Is it clear? And usually in the citadel, that is upper town part, usually the elites of the society, they used to live in the upper town, elites, social elites. Whereas in the lower town, the common people used to live. So, there is a clear cut class difference here. Okay, the people who belong to the upper classes, they are living in upper town. Lower classes people, they are living in lower town of the city. This is one more unique aspect, uniformity and urban planning are the unique aspects of Indus Valley Civilization. Second, third one is, third unique aspect of the Indus Valley Civilization is, usually the Indus Valley Civilization is considered to be a defensive civilization, but not an offensive civilization. Okay, because you do not find, okay, numerous weapons in Indus Valley Civilization, sir. Okay, weapons are very few and far in between. For a civilization which is having 1.3 million square kilometers, Usually, defenses should be very strong. Yes, okay. Usually, there should be a large military of their own, but we do not find any evidence of weapons, okay, in Indus Valley civilization. Weapons of attack are not present. These people used to produce more shields than swords, sir. 
Are you getting it? Okay, it means that they are trying to defend themselves rather than in offense, they were focused on defense. That is the reason why every city is surrounded by a fortification wall. Fort is also a defense structure. So, the most unique aspect of this civilization is it is a defensive civilization, but not an offensive civilization. Is it making sense? Okay, for such a large extent of an empire, okay, these people should have numerous weapons, but these people did not have weapons in large numbers. This is the third unique aspect. Then the fourth aspect of Indus Valley Civilization people is, okay, this is also one more unique aspect of the Indus Valley Civilization people, defensive civilization, that is one. Then the fourth aspect or unique aspect of Indus Valley Civilization is its script. Okay, on Indus Valley Civilization script, there can be a good mains question. So, in fact, the script of Indus Valley Civilization is very, very unique, sir. I will explain the story of Indus Valley Civilization script just like the urban planning thing. Okay, just listen to this. So, when it comes to the Indus Valley Civilization script, uh, this script is known as logosyllabic script. Okay, it is considered to be logosyllabic. Okay, logosyllabic script. Okay, the meaning of logosyllabic script is usually the scripts are of two formats. Sir. One is okay, the script which has some letters in it. Okay, and letters put together becomes words, right? Okay, just like the English language, whatever languages are there. There are letters in them and when the letters are put together, they will become words. But logosyllabic script is a unique script wherein each letter, it signifies a word in itself. Sir. Okay, just like uh, you are in your phone, you might be using this, uh, what are they called as? Emojis. Emojis are in fact, each emoji is a representation of an emotion, a word. You need not type the entire thing in order to say that you are happy, you will just send a smiley, okay, it means that you are happy, yes or no? Logosyllabic script is a script which is similar to the emoji script, sir, wherein each letter it signifies a word in itself. That is the reason why deciphering the script is become very, very difficult, sir. That too, what these people did is, this used nearly 400 different symbols in order to represent, sir. Okay, how many alphabets are there for us? Okay, 20? Six alphabets are there. But here in Indus Valley Civilization, we see 400 unique symbols. And understanding the meaning of these symbols is almost impossible even today. Even with the most advanced computer techniques, we are unable to decipher these scripts. Okay, one reason is there are numerous, numerous symbols is one. Then apart from that, wherever you find the writing of Indus Valley Civilization people, we usually find them on very short tablets which are known as seals. Okay, short tablets which are known as seals. On these seals, on top you find this writing set. Is it alright? Okay, and Indus Valley Civilization, we don't find large writing tablets at any place. Only small scripts are present on tablets. And 400 unique symbols are present here. Okay, that is the second one. Then third one is, while writing this Indus Valley script, usually the script is written. Okay, usually most of our scripts are today written from left to right, right? Yes, except from, for some scripts like Arabic and Persian, Urdu, which are written from right to left. Okay, so, in fact, the Indus Valley Civilization script is also started from right and then it moves to left. Okay, but it does not stop there. Sir. Yeah, unlike Arabic and Persian, it does not stop there. So, it in fact takes the form of a unique writing style which is known as Sarpalekhana. And in Sarpalekhana or Bosphophidan script, it is known as, you will start from right, you will go to left, then you go from left to right and you go this way. Okay, this is a writing style. Very unique, right? Okay, so in fact, this style is known as Sarpalekana because it looks like a serpent, a snake. So, this is called as Sarpalekana or Bastrophidan script, it is known as. This is also unique. Okay, and see, many historians that tried to decipher this script, they failed. So, after failing in this venture, these people, they started finding the similarities between the Indus Valley Civilization script and contemporary language script, sir. Okay, that is where a political controversy started. Okay, initially, it is felt that the Indus Valley Civilization script, it is similar to the Brahmi script, okay, which evolved, evolved during the Vedic period. Okay, so many people thought that it is similar to the Brahmi script. Then, some other historians who are distinguishedly right-wing, they started comparing the Indus Valley Civilization script with Sanskrit script, sir. Are you following this? Okay, but the thing is, both these comparisons, they were not, in fact, having any scientific link between them. 
Then thereafter, okay, one particular person by the name of Airavati Mahadevan, okay, he started comparing, okay, then along with that there is one more person called Parpola, okay, two people are there, I will dictate their names, do not worry about them, Airavati Mahadevan is one, second one is Parpola, okay, so Parpola is in fact a German historian, sir, so these two people, they started comparing the Indus Valley Civilization script with Tamil script, okay, and they were able to scientifically prove that there are some similarities between both of them. Then apart from that, recently, okay, just 10 years back, there is a site which is known as Kiladi, okay, which is pronounced, written as Kijdi, but it is pronounced as Kiladi, okay, it is written as Kijdi, because in uh, Tamil, Z and L are one and the same, La, they are known as La, it is pronounced as Kiladi, but the site, uh, it is written as Kijdi. So, at this site, what these people were able to do is, they were able to find some pot sheds, Pot threads means the pieces of pot. Okay? And on these pot threads, when they studied the pot threads, there, there is a clear evolution from the Indus Valley Civilization script to the Tamil script. Are you following this, sir? This is a recent discovery. The Kiladi inscription or the Kiladi pot threads, they clearly show the link between Indus Valley Civilization site script and okay, the Tamil script. Is it all right? Okay, today most of the debate is settled, sir. Okay, it is almost similar to or somewhat similar to the Tamil script. Some words in Tamil, they reflect the same kind. Is it alright? Okay, so finally, Brahmi, Sanskrit, okay, and Dravidian script. Okay, today, because of the Kiladi excavations, this has been conclusively proved. Is it alright? So, this is the story of the Indus Valley Civilization script. This is one more unique aspect of Indus Valley Civilization. So, we discussed about script. We discussed about defensive civilization. We talked about uniformity and urbanization. Yes? Okay, then along with that, we talked about how it is an urban civilization. So, these are some of the unique aspects and one more unique aspect of Indus Valley Civilization is the Indus Valley Civilization, it is in fact a trading civilization, sir. Okay, trading civilization and it had very well developed trading networks across the world. Okay, not only within India, they were also trading with the Mesopotamian civilization, they were trading with the Egyptian civilization, they were trading with, okay, the people who are li living in Bahrain, Okay, then along with that, okay, so this uh, Arabian desert region people say we, they were trading. In fact, this trade activities of the Indus Valley civilization, they got converted them into a cosmopolitan civilization. Cosmopolitan, what is the meaning of cosmopolitanism? Huh? Uh, you take, okay, traditions from different cultures and if you mix them together, then it is known as cosmopolitan culture. Okay, usually, Bombay is a city which is considered as a cosmopolitan city in India. Okay, primarily because it is a city of immigrants from various areas and foreign influence is also there. So, because of which cosmopolitanism is clearly reflected in Indus Valley civilization. Sir. Then, apart from cosmopolitanism, one more key character of Indus Valley civilization is it had an element of tolerance within it. Okay, tolerance and how did we prove that they are tolerant people? Okay, if you see. In fact, in Indus Valley Civilization, in the same street, okay, when they studied the houses in the same street, okay, in each house, a different religious practice is followed, sir. Are you following what I am trying to say? Okay, so people who belong to different, different religious practices, they coexisted together in the same street. That proves that the people were not imposing their own idea of religion on others. Are you following what I am trying to say? One house may, there is fire altar worship. Okay, so, the people have constructed an Agnastal. One house may there is worship of Mother Goddess. Okay, mother Goddess is usually Grama Devata. Okay, every village has one okay, deity of its own who is a fertility goddess. So, one house may there is Mother Goddess. Then, in the immediate next house, you find evidence for okay, worship of water. Water cult is there. In fact, the Indus Valley Civilization people, they used to believe in this purificatory capability of water. Okay, they used to believe that whatever sins you do, if you dip yourself into sacred water, then all your okay, sins will be washed away. Just the same belief of Kumbh Mela. Yes or no? Okay, so you in fact pollute Ganga. Yes or no? Okay, because you conduct so many sins and you go dip there, the Ganga will get polluted. Okay, that is how Ganga itself has become polluted today. So, the same way the Indus Valley Civilization people, they also believed in the purificatory capability of water. That is the reason why they constructed the great bath at Mohanjadaro. So, which one? Fire altar means Ignasthal. Okay, so they construct one okay raised platform on the center. Okay, usually they havan. Okay, 
ओके हवन करने के लिए यज्ञस्थल होता है ना ओके सो दैट इज द सेम थिंग यज्ञस्थल ओके देन नेक्स्ट वन इज दिस मदर गॉड इज कल्ट नेक्स्ट वन इज वाटर वर्शिप ओके एंड इन द नेक्स्ट हाउस यू फाइंड ट्री वर्शिप हियर ओके सो इट मींस दैट पीपल हु आर फॉलोइंग डिफरेंट डिफरेंट स्पिरिचुअल प्रैक्टिसेस दे आर कोएग्जिस्टिंग टुगेदर दैट क्लियरली शोस दैट द इंडस वैली सिविलाइजेशन इज ए टॉलरेंट सिविलाइजेशन इज इट क्लियर देन अलोंग विद दैट इंडस वैली सिविलाइजेशन इज आल्सो हैविंग वन मोर यूनिक एस्पेक्ट टू इट इट इज कंसीडर्ड एज ए सेकुलर सिविलाइजेशन इन इटसेल्फ ओके सेकुलर सिविलाइजेशन इट इज कंसीडर्ड एज के प्राइमरीली बिकॉज़ हियर इन इंडस वैली सिविलाइजेशन मोस्ट ऑफ द स्पिरिचुअल प्रैक्टिसेस आर कंफाइंड टू द प्राइवेट क्वार्टर सर there are no big public temples here this has been asked as a upsc prelims question you don't find any large structure in indus valley civilization which has been dedicated to god are you getting this sir so it means that these people are not very much focused on public display of their uh, religion in mesopotamian civilization and egyptian civilization you find large structures which are dedicated to god and people after death take the case of pyramids you would have taken so much effort to construct the pyramids even today many people consider them to be constructed by aliens okay but do they serve any secular purpose sir do they serve any secular purpose they are only religious structures but in indus valley civilization in place of the pyramid like structures they built huge granaries sir which are meant to okay, store grains and whenever a famine like condition occurs people can be distributed with the food rather than constructing temples it is good to construct granaries right i mean both have different purposes but i think you understand what i'm trying to say so these people are predominantly secular in their outlook okay they did not have any public display of their okay uh, faith and you don't find any large temple complexes or palaces are also not present in indus valley civilization sir where okay, there is more focus on building of granaries more focus on building of dams more focus on development of irrigation rather than in construction of large okay temple like structures is it making sense what i'm trying to say so this is one more unique aspect of indus valley civilization is it is a secular civilization so shall we have a look at the handout till here then thereafter we can continue our discussion because continuous monologue sometimes tend to take people to meditation <laughs> okay so yeah, i think i told about this once to with you guys okay about the half closed eyes usually half closed half closed eyes in indian civilization are a representation of spirituality okay higher spiritual status if someone achieves then it is represented usually with half closed eyes okay but i regularly see <laughs> the same okay from my vantage point i can see many half closed eyes usually okay <laughs> okay so higher spirituality spiritual beings are there Okay, so that's the case. Okay, I'm just joking. So just see this, sir. So Indus Valley Civilization glazed pottery. The unique pottery of Indus Valley Civilization is glazed pottery. Okay, glazed pottery is the pottery type here. Okay, the unique pottery. It means that it doesn't mean that every pot is glazed, but the most unique pots of Indus Valley Civilization are glazed. Okay, glazed means they have a reflective aspect to them. Okay, if you polish something very finely, then automatically it will tend to have light reflection capability. Stone also sometimes has to, uh, light reflection when you polish it very properly. Yes, so this is called as glazed pottery type. Okay, glazed pottery. So if you see that John Marshall, he excavated Indus Valley Civilization. Okay, in 1920s for the first time with the help of please write these people down. Okay, Dayaram Sahani is one. It's not given there. Okay, and R. D. Banerjee. Okay. so these days uh, we are having a chauvinistic outlook towards history too that is the reason why the indians who contributed are also important okay so we cannot say some textbooks that did not not even mentioning john marshall they are going directly to dayaram sahani okay but it is in fact a collective effort of all these people john marshall dayaram sahani and r d banerjee okay so these are the three people dayaram sahani r d banerjee and john marshall Indus Valley civilization is the first urban civilization in India. It is contemporary to Mesopotamian civilization, which is present on the river banks of Tigris and Euphrates. Then Chinese civilization, which is built on the banks of the river Hangu, okay, Hangu River. Then the third one is Nile civilization, which is present in Egypt. Okay, 
okay these th four civilizations were contemporary to each other parallel okay at the same time they were coexisting then uh, indus valley civilization is on the river banks of gagar hakra that is saraswati river and indus river two rivers are there not just one two indus and gagar hakra so i talked about the Sa sindhu saraswati civilization right yes so then geographical extent is area is 1.3 million square kilometers and extent of civilization it started from Manda in Jammu and Kashmir, Daimabad in Maharashtra, Alamgirpur in Uttar Pradesh and Sukta Gendur in Pakistan. And there are four racial types in Indus Valley Civilization. We talked about them, right? Proto-Australoid are the people whose racial type is similar to okay, the tribals of Central India. Okay, tribals of Central India, all of them are having the same racial type that is Proto-Australoid. Take the Mundas, Santals, all of them are Proto-Australoids. All right? So, Proto-Australoid is one. Second one is Mongoloid. Third one is Alpine. And fourth one is military. So these four racial types are considered to be the builders of Indus Valley civilization. Okay, based on skeletal studies, we can easily understand the racial type, right? Is it fine or not? Okay, what I'm trying to see. Then, okay, so we talked about the sites, prominent ones, all of them we discussed. Then origin of Indus Valley civilization, theory one, product of diffusion of Mesopotamian civilization, migration from Iran, Iraq belt to Afghan Balochistan belt. Product of diffusion of Mesopotamian civilization. Theory is proposed by Mortimer Wheeler. Okay. So, if you want, you can write it. Theory is proposed by Mortimer Wheeler. Diffusion theory. Mortimer Wheeler. Okay. So, but uh, no possibility of a question. Okay. Very less possibility. Because it is disproved theory, right? Why will they ask a question on disproved theory? Very slight possibility. Okay. But the proved theory is this indigenous origin theory. Primarily because Indus Valley pattern emerges from the towns and cities is documented archaeologically. Yes. Then given evidence of four village cultures of Balochistan that is Nal, Kuli, Job and Quetta. This has been asked as a prelims question, sir. Okay, the four village cultures of Balochistan. This has been asked as a question, prelims question. Nal, Kuli, Job and Quetta. Is it all right? Then some practices of agriculture, religious, trade and commerce practices show a clear path of evolution of Indus Valley civilization around these villages. Is it all right? So, I already talked about Mehargar link also. I talked about Neolithic to Indus Valley civilization. So, the, the Mehargar plus these four villages, they prove that Indus Valley civilization is domestic in origin, but not foreign origin. All right. Okay. So, next one is time period. Initially, the timeline is given as 3200 BC to 2750 BC. I think I told this thing wrongly. Okay, if you, someone has made a note, please correct. So, John Marshall, he told it from 3200 BC to 2750 BC. I think I told uh, 3500 to, yes, so please change it to 3200 to 2750 BC. Later, 2500 BC to 1750 BC based on archaeological evidence by Mortimer Wheeler. Is it alright? Yes. Then, one more thing is distinctive features are written script. Yes. External trade and commerce which led to cosmopolitan character of the civilization. I talked about them. Yes or no? Okay, so, if any point I did not discuss, I will discuss again. Then, agricultural surplus is one more. Agricultural surplus in Baluchistan, people migrated to Indus Valley civilization, which led to the first wave of urbanization. Then, after the first wave of urbanization, Indus Valley civilization was also okay, modern, but there is no weapons of destruction were found and there is no evidence of warfare too. Yes, for a, such a large civilization, people should definitely fight against each other, but these people are not fighting. Okay, they are living coexisting happily with each other. They are not even creating number of swords. They were only making shields. Okay, so this is very unique, right? Okay, then along with that, uh, they have large extent about nearly 1.3 million square kilometers. They had buildings, houses, etc., which are similar. Okay, so uniformity is a very important aspect. Every brick is of similar size. Okay, what is the size that I have told about? One is to two, one is, to two is to four. Okay, so one is to two is to four. Then weights and values are clearly demarcated, sir. This is also important. In fact, they have a weight system which is in multiples of 60. Okay, you can write it down. Their weight system is in multiples of 60. 16, 1, 6. Usually 16 is considered to be very auspicious figure, right? Okay, 60. Their weight numbers were in multiples of 60. 1, 6. 16. 16. Okay, their weight system is multiples of 60. They had a clear municipal administration. I talked about this municipal administration, right? Okay, which contained houses like grid-like pattern. 
yes okay then along with that uh, they are having this system which is known as watch and ward system okay with public lights and watchmen right now watch and ward system is a system which works with public lights and watchmen okay so in fact uh, absence of street lights is a major threat to security of women particularly in many urban areas in india today so they had a clear cut watch and ward system back then okay so then apart from watch and ward system one more unique thing okay did you write them already okay i talked about this uh, drainage system with cesspits yes covered drainage system with cesspits every house having a private washroom of its own okay so private washroom of its own so then green buildings with uh, okay what is that called open courtyard in center okay open courtyard its center so all of these are unique aspects sometimes i tend to discuss more number of points okay but they will come here or there in architecture somewhere they will come sir okay but some points will be unique please write them down okay now apart from this okay one more thing about uh, the indus valley civilization so in uniqueness uh, did we miss anything that we discussed sir i think we discussed some 7 to 8 points secular character write it down so if you did not write you write secular character is one no big public places of worship or palaces Okay, this point particularly has been asked as a question. Okay, no big places of public worship or palaces. Okay, in Mesopotamia, people used to build with the help of slaves huge temple complexes, sir. Okay, huge temple complexes they used to build with the help of slaves. Pyramids also were built by slaves. Okay, so every civilization was focusing on okay, this kind of religious structures, but these people they did not focus on religious structures, sir. Okay. So, I am not saying that religious structures are bad, they should not be built. Okay. But significance, okay. so how much significance you should give to religion, how, should, how much significance you should give to the secular aspects of life, we have to be clear of. All right. Okay. Then after there is administrative apparatus. Okay. I think I discussed most of it already. For 1.3 million square kilometer civilization, there is such peace, number one. Number two is uniformity is present. Yes or no? So, which proves that they had a very, very well organized state structure. Without state, is it possible to maintain such kind of uniformity, sir? Definitely, there is a need for state, number one. Number two is, along with that, there is no warfare here. Okay, both weak and strong are living happily together. No warfare. That is the meaning of warfare, right? Okay, warfare is what? The strong attacks the weak, then it becomes warfare. But the weak and strong, without any conflict, they are coexisting together. It means that there is a highly developed state structure in Indus Valley Civilization. But the thing is, because we are unable to decipher their script, we are not able to understand who the rulers are in Indus Valley Civilization. There is definitely state. But what kind of state is this? No one knows. Whether the state is ruled by a hereditary family, that is one theory which has been proposed, but it has been disproved. Okay, Then second theory which has been proposed is, merchants were the rulers of Indus Valley Civilization. Okay. Then the third theory which has been proposed is, in fact, in Indus Valley Civilization, the shaman or priest is the king. Three theories have been proposed, of which the most accepted theory today is, merchants are the rulers of Indus Valley Civilization. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Usually merchants require peace, they don't want warfare. Are you following what I'm trying to say? So that is the reason why, okay, usually the right now today accepted theory is merchants are rulers of Indus Valley Civilization. Okay, but we also find one bust of a bearded man sir, in Indus Valley Civilization. You might have seen this bust of a bearded man, okay, half closed eyes, wearing a hairband, okay, having a beard of his own, wearing a trefoliate, okay, dress. Okay, you might have seen the image of a bearded busted, yes, yes or no? Okay, so fortunately, no BJP person has seen this image. Otherwise, they would have said that it is, in fact, <laughs> okay, <laughs> prediction of Modi becoming the prime minister. <laughs> okay, so you might have known this bearded man, right? You might have seen it. Yes. So it looks similar, somewhat similar to <laughs> Modi. Okay, so okay, but no one has seen. Okay, good that BJP doesn't have a proper history wing. Okay, so <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Ah, changing history, yes. Okay, so just I'm joking. Okay, but this bearded man is also considered to be a priest king of Indus Valley civilization, sir. Okay, and that is also one theory, okay, which has been proposed. Okay, this way various theories have been proposed about Indus Valley civilization's administration and state. 
But the only thing that is accepted today is definitely they had a very strong state. Otherwise, without a strong state, peace is not possible. Without a strong state, uniformity is not possible, sir. Is it all right? Okay, so that is the administrative apparatus. Okay, just have a look at this. There is remarkable element of centralization and control in Indus Valley civilization. Yes, centralization and control is present. Then this uniformity points to centralized authority who controls the day to day life of the Indus Valley people through standardization. Yes, for such a large civilization with centralized authority, there is very little evidence of usage of violence. Usually, centralization is associated with violence, right? Yes, but even though there is centralization, there is no violence here. Is it clear? Okay, so no violence here. Okay, no wars or evidence of weapons. So, in fact, that is the reason why this authority is considered to be spiritual authority. Okay, when it is political authority, it leads to violence. But spiritual authority, if it is in fact established, then there will be no violence. Are you understanding what I am trying to say? Okay, so that is one more aspect of this. Then no significant archaeological evidence of waging war and weapons. This is also considered that Indus Valley civilization is a defensive civilization with fortification walls and defensive weapons. We already talked about it. Yes, urban layout of Indus Valley civilization shows segregation of classes. Okay, so elite in citadel and common people. Okay, are present in lower towns. I talked about it. Yes or no? Okay, then apart from that, there are many public buildings like granaries which point to the existence of political authority. Naturally, right? Granaries, if they are present, automatically it is a symbolism of political authority. Is it alright? People are able to collect the grains and store them at one place and distribute them among the people in that situation of crisis. It means that there is a very well functional state. Then along with that, Harappa evidence of big granaries are present. Harappa was the first excavated site in the civilization and hence Indus Valley civilization is also known as Harappan civilization. Okay, but there you write one more statement. But today, the name of Sindhu Saraswati civilization is attributed to IVC. But today, the name of Sindhu Saraswati civilization is attributed to IVC as many new sites are discovered. as many new sites are discovered discovered on the banks of Saraswati river Saraswati river which is also called as Gagar Hakra river in the banks of Saraswati River. Okay. So here it is given, but I already detailed about it. Raki Gadi is the largest site. Talked about it, right? Yes. Then after that, clear cut evidence of municipal administration as there is regular maintenance of underground drains, watch and ward system for every block of the city, and clear planning in urban layout. Yes. Okay. Then apart from that, hmm? Sindhu Saraswati. I detailed it, right? Okay. So then next one is. It is also considered to be Bronze Age civilization. I told about it. It is an alloy of uh, copper. Okay. Some considered the trading class to be the ruler of Indus Valley civilization. Some others considered that there is a separate class of priest kings in Indus Valley civilization. And the best example is bearded man bust is considered to be a symbol of priest king. Is it clear? Okay. But today's accepted okay uh, idea is merchants were the rulers of Indus Valley civilization. Is it clear, sir? Okay. So now polity may we have covered, administration is covered, uniqueness is covered, origin is covered, excavation is covered, extent is covered. Five things are covered now. Now, okay, every part is important for prelims, sir. Okay, Indus Valley Civilization is a very, very important topic. In fact, you can put five stars here. This is also a five star topic in UPSC prelims, Indus Valley Civilization. They will ask very good and in-depth prelims questions from this section, sir. Okay, you remember in modern India also I told some five star topics. Similarly, this is also a five star and very important topic. Now, the last one is, when the civilization is such a thriving civilization, why is there an abrupt end to Indus Valley civilization? In fact, in 1750 BC, the people of Indus Valley civilization, they voluntarily started withdrawing from the urban areas. And after that, they started migrating to the rural areas. They left the Saraswati river bank. They left the Indus Valley river bank. And from there, they migrated to the Gujarat region. And they settled down in Gujarat region. That too, mostly in village-like structures, but not in urban areas. So, why this sudden end to the Indus Valley civilization is a major question 
which has haunted the historians for many years. Sir. Okay, why will the people who are living in urban areas suddenly outmigrate? What went? Huh? Uh, natural calamities is one factor. Okay, let's suppose a big cyclone comes. Okay, so then naturally people will migrate out. And the Indus Valley civilization regions which they are present, they are prone to flooding. Yes. So, one theory which is proposed for the decline of Indus Valley civilization is excessive flooding in Indus Valley. Okay. Indus Valley and its tributaries may, there was excessive flooding because of which the sites in Indus Valley, they have declined is one theory which has been proposed. Then along with that, when will people migrate from urban areas to rural areas? Lawlessness, Lawlessness say, disease. Huh? Huh? disease, some epidemic outbreak we have seen during COVID period. Many people out migrated from urban areas to rural areas to save themselves. So, epidemic might be one cause. Okay, some kind of epidemic might have happened because of which the people have out migrated. Second one, because sometimes the epidemics without science they are unbeatable, right? Yes or no? People in large number will die. So, naturally, people have to out migrate. That is the second theory which has been proposed. Then, any other factor that you might think of? Uh, any invasion might occur. And when invasions occur, people usually tend to out-migrate. Take the case of Ukraine today. Most of the cities are bombarded. People are moving out from urban areas to rural areas. In fact, this is the most prominent theory which has been proposed by the same Mortimer Wheeler, sir. And what he did is, under the policy of the Britishers to divide and rule Indians, he said that it is the Aryans who are migrating from northwest of India who destroyed the Indus Valley civilization's urban centers and forced them to migrate to south region. Whereas, the north area was dominated by the Vedic Aryans, Bolke, they created a theory. Then naturally, the Indians will fight against each other. That is good for them. Okay, but while proposing this theory, he forgot one unique thing that be between the decline of Indus Valley civilization and emergence of Aryans to India, there is 50 year gap. Did the time travel to attack the people of Indus Valley civilization? He did not consider this 250 year gap. So, that is the reason why this theory is disproved. But this person, what he did, he went to the extent of studying the Vedas. In there, Indra is called as Purandara. Purandara means destroyer of forts. Who constructed forts? Indus Valley people. So, there is a conflict between Indra and the Indus Valley civilization people. Okay, he created one good theory. Okay, but this theory has been disproved primarily because of 250 years of void between the decline of Indus Valley civilization and emergence of Vedic Aryans in India. Are you following this, sir? Okay, so, this is the third theory which has been disproved and the fourth and most prominent theory which has been accepted today is Indus Valley civilization, it declined because of excessive usage of the natural resources which are present in IVC region. They were in fact cultivating crops in an unsustainable way. Primarily, they used to have bi-seasonal crop production, sir. Harif and Rabi. Okay, two seasons they used to cultivate crops in, number one. Second one is... The Indus Valley Civilization people, in order to bake their bricks, they destroyed the entire forest ranges of Indus Valley region. Because 1.3 million square kilometer civilization ke liye, har ghar mein baked brick hona hai to, naturally you have to cut down a lot many forests. Yes. The second factor is, they destroyed a lot many forests. And the third one is, because of excessive usage of irrigation, soil salinity will also increase. Take the case of Green Revolution Belt today, same problem. Okay, excessive irrigation is leading to soil salinity. Soil salinity, agar bad gaya to, naturally there will be decline in productivity. So, and productivity is important for agricultural surplus. Agricultural surplus is important for urbanization. Once agricultural productivity falls, automatically urbanization will also fall. Only when some other person is producing food for you, you can be involved in any other activity. If no one is producing food for you, you have to produce your own food. Because some farmer is working in some corner of India, people are able to sit in class. Are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Is it making sense? So that way, farming, in fact, the form productivity it has fallen, which led it to the decline of urban in nature of Indus Valley civilization. There is also one more theory that has been proposed. But the decline of a civilization which is of 1.3 million square kilometer, it cannot be explained with a single cause, sir. A multiplicity of factors, all of them work together in the decline. One is Indus Valley Civilization floods, particularly the city of Monjadaro, it has been abandoned because of repeated floods, sir. We fi can find archaeologically nearly seven times flood have happened in Monjadaro, because of which the city has been abandoned. Then the Saraswati river which has been spoken about, it got dried up, mythical river, it has disappeared. Why did the river disappear? 
primarily it disappeared because of a phenomenon called river capture sir you might be knowing about river capture you might have studied in geography about river capture so when tributaries of two to three rivers are flowing from the same region sometime one river will eat away the other river Yes, in fact, the tributaries of the Saraswati river were eaten away by Ganga and Indus, which led to no water in the Gagar Hakra belt. All of them are coming from Himalayas. On top, the Saraswati's tributaries, one tributary was taken over by Ganga. One tributary was taken over by Indus, which led to drying up of the entire Gagar Hakra belt. River capture, are you understanding this, sir? Might have heard about it, right? River capture. So, tributaries on their... Uh, so, on the mountain beaches, sometimes they change direction and join into a different river. That is what is called as river capture. Okay, river capture also has occurred, which led to the Gagar Hakra belt being dried up and it also declines. Is it making sense? But even though the urban civilization has declined, the Indus Valley people, they continued living in villages. Sir. Is it alright? There is no complete destruction of people. Okay, but sometimes there is okay some villages which continued the same pattern as Indus Valley civilization, but they were not able to produce agriculture surplus, which led it to decline of urbanization, but not the destruction of civilization. Is it clear, sir? And Mortimer Wheeler, I just wanted to tell one more th story. In fact, in Monjadaro, there is a street called Death Lane, sir, okay, in which 13 skeletons with uh, okay, uh, wounds of arms, they are found in the street of Monjadaro. Usually, the Indus Valley civilization people, they had great concern for the dead people. They used to bury them with elaborate rituals, they used to bury them. Yeah, but 13 skeletons have been left in the streets of Mohanjadar. And what this person did is, he said that this is the outcome of Aryan invasion. Okay, 13 people, okay, they have been killed. But if two civilizations and culture patterns, if they fight, will you find only 13 skeletons, sir? Okay, so, there will be innumerable number of skeletons, but 13 skeletons ko leke aadmi ne bola ki, ya pe war hua, okay, ya pe dekho ek ek skeleton pe, this sword wounds are there. So, this is the place where, okay, the final conflict between Indus Valley Civilization and Vedic culture, it has happened. Okay, but that is, it is completely disproved, it is in fact a deliberate policy of divide and rule in order to divide Indians into various strands, this was done, sir. Are you understanding this? Okay, so that is the case. Okay, so now just see this, sir. So where was it? Uh, decline. Yes, bearded man bust. Okay, Indus Valley civilization. Script ke mein already I discussed. Just see this. Peculiar script. Evidences from seals of Indus Valley civilization. Seals are tablets. Okay, so usually they are clay and steatite tablets. Okay, I'll show the images of some uh, things. Then you'll understand it better. Okay, these are the seals, sir. Okay, these are the various seals. Can you see the script on top? These are clay and steatite tablets okay, on which usually some animal image is carved and on top the script is present. Sir. Okay, can you see the symbol of swastika? Yes, on bottom. Then along with that, okay, these are also having some spiritual significance of their own. Okay, can you see some seals are showing animal images, elephant. Okay, this is considered to be a bull. Okay, zebu bull it is called as. Okay, then along with that some images of unicorn are also present. Sir. Okay, this is a unicorn. Okay, this is a unicorn, okay, horse with a, okay, uh, horn, no, no, yes, horse with a horn, this is a jebu bull, okay, tiger image is present, yes, then along with that, the most prominent seal of Indus Valley civilization is the seal which is known as Pashupati seal, okay, can you see a horned deity sitting in cross leg position in meditative pose, yes, and around him, the animals are present, one is, in fact, there is a code for this, it is called as bird tea. okay, bird means, B means bull, Okay, B means uh, bull, one second, okay, B means, uh, one second, bird, B, E, R, T, okay, B is a uh, uh, bull, second one, E is elephant, third one, R is rhinoceros, T is tiger and D is a deer. In fact, five animals are signified on this seal. Can you see the deer here, tiger here, okay, this is, uh, in fact, uh, the bull, okay, rhinoceros and elephant. Okay, these are the various animals which are carved onto this seal called Pashupati seal. It is in fact considered to be, okay, this tradition, it continued as the tradition of Lord Shiva. Following what I am trying to say, that is the reason why it is said that the Shiva is not a Vedic God. Okay, Shiva is a pre-Vedic God who was present from Indus Valley civilization period. Okay, one aspect is Pashupati here. Then apart from that, can you see here, okay, South Indian movie star fighting with two tigers. Okay. 
at the same time okay this is in fact <laughs> okay this seal is considered to be gilgamesh seal okay gilgamesh seal it is called as very prominent one he is a god in mesopotamian civilization sir okay a person who fights with the two tigers at the same time gilgamesh he is called as okay the seal is also a very prominent seal in indus valley civilization then apart from that you can also see an image with fantastic animals here fantastic animal means this is not a real animal in fact it has mixture of components of various animals in it yes okay so in fact not zebra the stripes here they meant tiger okay so <laughs> the meant tiger here so tiger okay anim uh, so then buffalo okay then the face is also very different so in fact it is a mixed of fantastic animal which has been created is it making sense so this way each seal it used to contain different different images sir so this is rhinoceros seal elephant seal gilgamesh okay then unicorn okay unicorn is the most prominent seal of indus valley civilization you will find numerous seals with unicorns but he, yes fiction this is also a fictional animal Okay, horse with a single horn. Unicorn seal is the most prominent seal of Indus Valley Civilization people. And these are the clay tablets and striatite tablets, sir. Striatite is a white powder with which also you can make tablets like uh, just like clay. Is it all right? So these are the most prominent seals of Indus Valley Civilization people. Okay. So then apart from that, you can see. Okay. So I'll tell some uh, aspects of the script first. Then after that, we will move to the next one. Peculiar script. Okay, found mostly on seals of Indus Valley Civilization, written from right to left. Evidence from some big name plates is also found. Okay, and the script type is known as Bostrophidan script or Sarpa Lekhan. Okay, there are 400 symbols here. And the script is logosyllabic script. Each symbol describes a word and having its own meaning. Okay, it is difficult to decipher these script as there are only there are nearly 400 symbols. And later day it led to a political conflict based on its origin. Some people propose that it's similarity to Sanskrit and Brahmi script. Some others propose its similarity to Dravidian script. So there you write. Okay. So Airavati Mahadevan and Parpola Airavati Mahadevan. Airavati. Okay. Airavati, you know. Okay. Airavati Mahadevan is one. Okay, so Airavati Mahadevan is one, Airavatam Mahadevan, okay, is one, second one is Parpola, P-A-R-P-O-L-A, Parpola, found similarities with, found similarities with Dravidian script, found similarities with Dravidian script, okay, and the recent Kiladi, the recent Kiladi pot shred evidences, please write this way. The Kiladi pot shred evidences prove the link to pot shred evidences, pot shred, pot shred evidences prove a link to. Dravidian script. Okay, prove a link to Dravidian script. Okay, can you see the Kiladi graffiti? Okay, so Kiladi graffiti is this, and they are very similar to the Indus signs, right? Can you see? Okay, so this way they found the some similarities between Kiladi uh, portraits and uh, the Dravidian script. Uh -huh. What are the significance yes i will tell about it in economy part but uh, since you asked i will talk about this so in fact the seals are used for authentication sir so what these people used to do is because most of the families in Indus Valley civilization they were involved in trade and commerce so when they were exporting their goods from one place to another as a symbol of authenticity they used to use these clay tablets and impress their signal onto okay i will tell you how they used to do let's suppose we they have produced one okay bag full of saris let's suppose so then after that they will tie them with a cloth and after tying them okay they will tie a knot at one end and after knotting it they will put some clay onto it sir wet clay and after putting the wet clay they will take the seal okay and they will impress the symbol onto the wet clay which is known as seal 
Are you following this? Okay, right now also whenever a house is sealed by the government, they will lock it, then after that tie one cloth to it, then after that they will put some red ink there and then after that seal it. Yes, so in fact this is a proof of non-temperance. If the seal is broken, then automatically it means that the goods have been stolen or changed. Are you getting? So that is the reason why the significance of seals is primarily for trade and commerce purpose, wherein they used to seal all of them into a cloth bag and pour some wet clay there. Then after that, they used to impress the symbol there, sir. Is it all right? Is it making sense? So that is how, okay, these things are usually done. Okay, so this is the case with this uh, seals and sealings, sir. So then apart from the seals and sealings, one more thing is, Decline of Indus Valley Civilization, I already talked about them. Econo ecological imbalance is one. Okay. Second one is uh, uh, delicate balance between agrarian surplus and urbanization, which got disturbed by over exploitation due to construction of reservoirs, not canals. Sir. Okay, it has been given wrongly here. Okay, because Indus Valley Civilization, it did not have any canals of its own. Okay, reservoirs, intensive agriculture, then increased salinity of soil. Bricks made up of baked bricks for baking, exploited forest. There is also occurrence of flood, river capture which led to drying up of Saraswati river. All of these things are given there. Which is missing. All this entire slide is missing. Huh? Pura slide miss ho gaya. How can it be? Only Aryan invasion theory is present. I think this one slide is missing. So, I will send it, sir. Okay, don't worry about it. I will send it. Okay, so or if you want to, you can take a photograph also. There is no problem. Okay, sometimes while copying, what happens is one slide it got missed. I will share it in group. Don't worry. I will share one photograph with Pratik. You can share it in group. Okay. I will share, I will take uh, the screen capture I will do and I will send, okay, do not worry. Okay, but <laughs> photographic skills you are testing, okay, fine, whatever it might be, okay, but is it understandable, sir, is it making sense? Now, the next one is, listen to me carefully, the next one is uh, this Aryan invasion theory, evidence is Indra was considered as god of war, called as Hariyayupiya, he is destroyer of forts okay so then skeletons left on streets with weapon wounds found by wheeler okay but this is disproved because indus valley civilization ended in 1750 bc entry of early vedic aryans in india it occurred in 1500 bc which has nearly 250 years gap between them. is it all right so then the definition of urbanization is given here if even though it is not is it given there no it might not be given there okay you just write it okay any urban area is the one census definition of urban area is 5000 population Density of 400 per square kilometer and 75 percent of male population should be in non agricultural work. Then it is considered as an urban area. It is not that way. I will talk about it. Okay. Society ka mein baat karunga, uske saath mein mein baat karunga. Okay. So, because Indus Valley civilization, it is a very unique civilization primarily because it is a matter local civilization, sir. Okay. Matter local civilization means what? Okay. So, matter locality means what? After the marriage, the husband will migrate to wife's house. Okay. That is what is known as matter locality. And Indus Valley civilization is proved to be matter local. Okay, primarily because when, okay, so with the evolution of genetic studies, people started studying the skeletons of Indus Valley civilization graveyard, sir. And they were surprised to know that all the women in a particular graveyard, they are genetically linked to each other. Okay, but if you go to any Indian village today, and if you excavate the dead bodies, only the male members will be related to each other. 
But in Indus Valley Civilization, all the women who are present in the graveyard, they are having the same genetic type. It means that the women, they never used to out-migrate from their family. That proves clearly matter locality. Are you understanding what I am trying to say? Okay. In fact, it is a matrilocal civilization that is number one. Number two is it is also matrilineal civilization. Naturally, matrilocality always is associated with matrilineality. Lineality means what the property will flow through the women's line. So, naturally, matrilocality and matrilineality, if they are there, women's position will be more dominant than men's position. Is it making sense or not? Okay, today's men's position is strong primarily because of patrilocality and patrilineality. But here it is matrilocal and matrilineal civilization, Indus Valley civilization society is very, very unique primarily because all the women who are present in a particular graveyard, they are related to each other. That is one unique thing about Indus Valley civilization society, number one. Number two is Indus Valley civilization society, that is the next topic that is anyhow we are going to discuss, that is the next topic. Then apart from this, one more unique thing of about Indus Valley civilization is society is one is its matrilocality and matrilineality. Second one is there are clear class structures in society. Okay, so because there are upper town and lower town is present. Number one. Then number two is some houses are built in upper town with 32 rooms in them. Naturally, it shows that it is a house of a rich person. Whereas in lower town, you find single chambered houses too. Only one room is present. Yes, that is one thing, society class stratification is present. Then, apart from this, if you look at the Indus Valley civilization, its religion is very, very unique, primarily because diverse religious practices are present together. I already talked about it. Mother goddess worship is one. Then second one is water worship, fire worship is present. Then fourth one is, in fact, the Indus Valley civilization people, they believed in this cult which is known as fertility cult. Okay, fertility cult is a very, very prominent cult in India from Indus Valley civilization time. In fact, as part of this fertility cult, you find some images of Linga also in Indus Valley civilization. You know that, uh, okay, this uh, Linga is also a form of fertility cult. You know, that uh, Linga and uh, Yoni, okay, usually that is a mixture, okay. So, Shiva is a mixture of Linga and Yoni. Yes, so in fact, it is a fertility cult and the fertility cult was present from Indus Valley civilization period on. Then along with that, these people used to believe in black magic too, sir. Okay, that is the reason why the, these people, most of them, they used to tie amulets to their bodies. Amulet means, okay, right now also many people tie, okay, some or the other form of amulet, okay, is what's called, uh, not locket, uh, uh, tabis, yes, okay, tabis is the one. So, this amulets and lockets they used to tie onto themselves, okay, so that is one more. Then apart from black magic, okay, the Indus Valley civilization people, one more unique aspect of theirs is, they used to have this worship called tree worship in which they used to Worship the people tree. Okay, people tree okay, is the one which they used to worship. Tree worship is also present in their religion. Then along with these things, okay, one more unique thing about the Indus Valley Civilization Society is, okay, so religion may, so different kinds of worship are present. So Linga is present. Then in society, we already studied that there are four races in the society and they are coexisting together. Okay, there is one more unique thing about the society. So, religion ke baare mein humko pata chal gaya. So, then along with that social structure ke baare mein, class ke baare mein humko pata chal gaya. So, then unique religious practices we got to know. Then, when it comes to the technology of Indus Valley Civilization, last one, okay, it is considered to be a Bronze Age Civilization. Yes, Bronze Age Civilization, it is considered to be. Okay, so then apart from this, okay, the Indus Valley Civilization people, they used to cultivate crops in bi-seasonal fashion. Bi-seasonal. Then apart from that, the main agricultural products which they are producing, they are barley, wheat and rice. These are the three important products. Then apart from barley, wheat and rice, the Indus Valley Civilization people, they are known for production of cotton. Okay, and majority of their exports, they revolved around cotton based exports. Sir. Is it clear? So they had a very good unique weaving practice of their own and majority of their exports are textile exports to western world. Is it all right? Then along with that, so even though the Indus Valley Civilization people's uh, script is undeciphered, okay, we have deciphered the Mesopotamian Civilization script. And this Mesopotamian Civilization script and the Mesopotamian Civilization people, they used to call the people of Indus Valley Civilization as the people from Meluha. Okay, in fact, the ancient name of Indus Valley Civilization is Meluha. 
okay so that is the reason why there is a book also written on this uh, immortals of meluha meluha is in fact the name of original name of indus valley civilization is meluha okay but we are not following this uh, convention we are following the names which have been given by the britishers to this civilization we are following okay but the original name is meluha then apart from that these people they used to have trading relations with i told you mesopotamia and the same mesopotamian uh, script it calls the area which is today is bahrain as dilma okay today is bahrain so in fact the indus valley civilization people they used to trade with dilma dilma is okay bahrain then along with that they also used to trade with this region which is known as makkah okay makkah is in fact the makaran coast which is present in iraq Okay, Iran, Pakistan share a coast called Makran coast, right? So, in fact, that Makran coast is known as Makan, Dilman and Meluha. These were the original names for these cities, sir, for these civilizations. Then along with that, one more unique thing about this Indus Valley civilization people is, they used to trade with the help of coastal shipping, sir. Okay, this is important. Coastal shipping means what? Okay, they did not have the okay, necessary equipment or technology to venture into deep ocean. So, they used to travel on sea. But they never used to lose sight of the land. Are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Okay, close coastal shipping means where well, you know about coastal shipping. Even in India, also right now is trying to promote coastal shipping between Gujarat to Bengal. Okay, it means that without losing the sight of land, they used to travel because they were afraid of deep oceans. Is it making sense? Okay, that is one more unique thing about the Indus Valley Civilizations Society. Okay, so these are the important aspects, sir. So let's have a look at this section once. Okay, so now uh, proto-historical period, presence of written documents, but the documents are undeciphered. So that is the reason why it is called as proto-history. We talked about it already. It is known as the first urban civilization. Agricultural surplus has led to urbanization. Okay, so then after this, the next one is class division in society, citadel for upper classes, lower town for commoners. Multiple rooms and single room uh, roomed houses are present. Then evidence of different kinds of burials, sir. Okay, this is also one more unique thing. I forgot to tell about it. In fact, the Indus Valley civilization people they used to follow many different kinds of burials, sir. One burial is cremation. Okay, that is burning the dead after uh, they die is cremation. Second one is a burial which is known as okay this uh, pit burial. Okay, we used to, where they used to dig a pit and then bury the person. Pit burial is the second one. Third one is known as pot burial, sir. Usually for the lower classes of society, they used to follow this pot burial concept, wherein they used to cram the dead body into a small pot and then bury it. Are you following this? So then apart from that, there is also one more burial called partial burial. So you know about Parsis? Okay, you know how the Parsis bury their dead? So first initially they expose their dead body to their dead bodies to the vultures, and whatever is left by the vultures, they will bring and then bury it. Okay, this is known as partial burial. In fact, in Indus Valley Civilization, we find all these burial, burial practices put together are present in Indus Valley Civilization. Sir. Then along with that, with every buried dead body, they used to place some or the other goods with the dead body. Burial goods they are known as. Okay, so that the people can use them in afterlife. Yes, so that is one more thing. So, evidence of different burials, burying the dead with gold ornaments, cramming them in pots, etc. were present. Okay, you can write, they followed cremation, partial burial. They followed cremation, partial burial. Pit burial and pot burial. Cremation. Cremation. Okay. Pot burial. Pit burial. And along with that, one more is partial burial. Okay. Four. Four types of burials are present here. Is it all right, sir? Taking sense? Now the next one is. Okay, so this is one picture, okay, artistic reimagination of the Indus Valley Civilization cities. Okay, so see it, okay, it has very good grid-like pattern, right, can you see? All roads are running parallel to each other, yes? Then can you see the large granary which is present here? Okay, so this is granary. Then along with that, can you see the coastal shipping? Okay, uh, co sorry, river shipping, can you see it? Okay, then along with that... Uh, Okay, so these are the main aspects sir, which are displayed in this uh, thing. Okay, this is the uh, granary. Okay, there are in fact two granaries. One is this and second one is this. Okay, this way they have constructed very good granaries too. So this is the uh, urban area of Indus Valley Civilization. Gender relations. Okay, typically they followed family system. But material locality and material reality are seen from burial evidence. 
okay so from the evidence of burials we sign find matrilocality and matrilinearity okay matrilocality and matrilinearity is seen so this is in fact very unique thing sir okay no other civilization in india has this prominent aspect of matrilocality and matrilinearity is it all right okay so then apart from this religion based on worship of mother goddess okay, i'll show the image of mother goddess for you okay, this is the typical image of mother goddess okay, it is a very crude clay made image sir okay, which shows the mother goddess okay so it is she is usually the goddess of common people okay so mostly in lower town you find her images okay she is also a symbol of fertility okay in some of the images she is shown as a pregnant lady too. Okay, because fertility is a major concern for all ancient civilizations because fertility is considered with two factors one is continuation of family second is fertility is associated with agriculture only when the land is fertile then only agricultural crops will grow so one is family continuation second one is agricultural continuation both of them are symbolized in this lady called mother goddess is it making sense now Apart from this, can you see this uh, worship of fire altar? It can be seen in Kalibangan. I talked about it. Then ritual bathing practices which are present at Mohanjadaru, okay, where they constructed this bath called Great Bath of Mohanjadaru. I will show the image. Worship of mythical animals like unicorn. Yes. Then apart from that, people of different religions live together. Talked about this. Okay. So then apart from that, racial, it is multiracial. Already we talked about it. Okay. So then uh, economy. Okay, now the last aspect is economic aspect. So just see this. Uh, this is the great bath, sir. Monjadar. Okay, Monjadaro's great bath. Okay, so is this one? Okay, now let's discuss about economy. That is the last part of Indus Valley civilization. In fact, we will try and study it more scientifically, sir. It is primary, secondary, and tertiary sector. We will study three sectors are. There. Okay, any economy can be classified into these three sectors. Okay, usually in primary sector here, what kind of crops are grown? I already talked about it. Yes, then I told about bi-seasonal cultivation. Yes, then along with that, these people used to use plow and digging stick for cultivation. Sir. Okay, two things will be there. One is plow and the second one is digging stick. Okay, digging stick. Okay, digging stick and plow, both of these are used okay, in cultivating the crops. Then apart from plow and digging stick, these people they knew about uh, okay construction of bullock carts but these bullock carts are constructed with solid wheels i told you it is the aryans who brought in spoked wheels these people also used to use bullock carts with solid wheels but not spoked wheels sir is it all right then apart from this in agriculture okay in agriculture or in primary sector okay in economy there is production of agricultural surplus that we already talked about Okay, so by seasonal cultivation, I think I talked about the by seasonal cultivation. So all of these are important aspect of their agriculture, sir. Number one, is it all right? Then apart from this, the second aspect, if you see secondary sector, secondary sector may these people were mainly producing textiles. Cotton textiles are the main export item of Indus Valley civilization. And apart from the cotton textiles, the second thing that they used to export is they used to export numerous beads sir okay you know beads okay, usually necklaces will have beads of their own so bead manufacturing is one of the main manufacturing sector in indus valley civilization sir they used to uh, in fact develop beads with the help of pearls okay very costly uh, uh, costly stones they used to import and with them they used to make beads that too very colorful beads they used to make sir is it all right so then apart from beads the third activity in secondary sector is Brick making and construction is also one more activity in secondary sector. Okay, construction and brick making is the third activity. So this is one more activity in secondary sector. Then apart from that, the last one is tertiary sector. In tertiary sector, I already talked about the trade activities. So I have given a list of items which have been imported by the Indus Valley Civilization and their exports too. I have given a list. So we will look at the list, sir. Is it all right? Okay, because UPSC tends to ask these kind of questions. You remember, I think I told in modern India also, what are the products which have been imported from the new world to the old world in India? They asked a question. Yes, so similarly, they can ask a question on the export and imports of Indus Valley Civilization. So we will have a look at the list here. You okay, see this? Irrigation technology is very well developed at Dholvira. Okay, I talked about this uh, water harvesting system and dams here in Dholvira. Then plow agriculture in Kalibangan. 
Indus Valley Plains and Gagar Hakra River Plains are used. Okay, so then along with that first urbanization I already talked about, main agricultural products are wheat, rice, barley and cotton. Production is bi seasonal, one is Rabi and the second one is Kharif. Okay, Rabi is usually the winter crop, right? Yes, so winter crop and rainy season crop are the two crops which are produced here. Then there is also a prominent secondary sector, Chenhudaro is the industrial town, textile production, construction is a major industry. Yes. So, so this led to environmental imbalance and a decline of Indus Valley civilization that is not important. Then along with that they used to produce beads and bronze artifacts. Sir. Yes, this is also one important one, bronze artifacts. So, you might be knowing about the dancing girl, right? Yes, dancing of girl of Indus Valley civilization, she is a bronze image. Okay, they used to have a technique called lost wax technique, but I will discuss about it in sculpture. Okay, so lost wax technique is used in order to produce the bronze artifacts, I will discuss it separately. Then, apart from this, the next aspect is tertiary sector. So, here you have trade and commerce. So, when it comes to the tertiary sectors, trade and commerce, there are external and internal trade links. Okay. So, because of presence of script also, it facilitated trade and commerce. Forgot to tell about this right now. Script and writing, script and writing facilitates trade and commerce script and writing facilitates trade and commerce yes sir does it facilitate or not yes okay it definitely facilitates right okay without script and writing it is very difficult to do commerce okay then along with that okay even though they had a very well developed trade and commerce system most of their trading activities are done on the basis of barter sir the barter means they did not have any currency of their own. They used to exchange one good for another, which is known as barter system. Okay, so trade. So I told about uses of seals and sealings, proof of non-tampering. Yes, so no one has tampered with it, used as stamping purposes. Trade externally with Mesopotamia, called IBC people as Meluha. Okay, Dilman is Bahrain. Okay, Makan is considered to be the Makran coast. Technology was based on Bronze Age technology. There is no usage of coins. The trade is based on barter. Yeah, apart from the okay uh, stone beads, they also used to make metal beads of gold, silver, copper, and bronze were produced. Okay, this is also one more important production. Then, apart from this, okay, the last one is major import items. Okay, it's given there. Can you see? Gold is imported from South India, particularly this uh, mountainous region called Suvarnagiri. Okay, Suvarnagiri is nothing but this Kolar gold fields. Okay, so, Kolar gold fields are the place where they used to import gold from. Second one is copper, particularly from Rajasthan and Baluchistan, they used to import. Then the third item is tin from Afghanistan and Bihar. Then the precious stones like lapis lazuli is one, sir, okay, which is usually a blue colored stone. Okay, so please write the colors of these stones too. Maybe, okay, so if the examiner is uh, on full psych mode, they can ask this question. Okay, color of the stones too. Lapis lazuli is one color, which is blue color. Then two kios is blue green mix color. It is imported from Persia region. Two kios. Then uh, next one is amethyst from Maharashtra. It is purple colored. Agate from Gujarat, which is multicolored. Okay, jade green. Okay, so if you want, you can write them down. Jade is a green colored one. Okay, could, I think some things are missing in the handout. Some things are missing. Colors are missing at least. Okay, so conch shells uh, they used to import from Saurashtra and Deccan region. There is Gujarat and Deccan. So that too, okay, these conch shells are mainly imported from a region called Balakut. Okay. Not Balakut. One second, sir. And tell the name of the place. Not Balakut. Where is the map of Indus Valley Civilization? And it is present there. One second. Conch shells they used to mainly import from. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, nearby to Karachi there is Balakot. Yes, yes. It is in fact from uh, Balakot only they used to import, sir. Okay, so whenever I listen to Balakot, I remember the air strikes. Okay, this is different Balakot. They used to import it from there. In fact, one Karnataka chief minister at one point of time, 
what he did is after the eight strikes on Balakot, he said that the eight strikes have been conducted on Bagalkot. Okay, Bagalkot is a city in Karnataka. Everyone was shocked, sir. <laughs> why, why should there be a surgical strike on okay, a city within India? Okay, so he confused. <laughs> he called Balakot as Bagalkot. Okay, so that is the reason why I was a little careful here. Okay, so then uh, I think uh, we are done with this. Okay. So, main export items are agriculture products, textiles, pottery, shell and bone inlays, carnelian beads and terracotta statues. These are the main export items of Indus Valley Civilization people. So, I will share the slides or I will pick a photograph of the same and I will send it to you. Do not worry about it. Okay, but they can ask a question. Which of the following products are exported from Indus Valley Civilization? Okay, they will give the names. Are you getting what I am trying to say? So, they will deliberately include words like, okay, so this amethyst, jade, these kind of things they will definitely include sir are you following this what kind of question is possible here so then finally okay so it is considered as a secular civilization we already talked about it so it is high levels of material prosperity is seen so there is also high levels of specialization in craft too so all of these are the unique aspects of indus valley civilization we already talked about them so this finishes the discussion on indus valley civilization we had a very thorough discussion on the polity emergence decline of indus valley civilization Society and economy of Indus Valley Civilization, all aspects we have covered. Is it alright, sir? Okay, so now we will be left with only okay, the architecture of Indus Valley Civilization, of which I will discuss in the evolution of architecture in India. I will discuss it separately. Is it alright? Okay. Now, after this section, we have the early Vedic period, is the next age in history. So let us discuss the early Vedic period. Okay, early Vedic period ke mein baat pehle hum log. Okay, so then after that, I will be able to finish early Vedic period, sir. First, listen to me. I will just narrate the story of early Vedic period. Then after that, okay, we will see the handout. Okay, in one go, let us finish this off. Okay, so when it comes to the early Vedic period, so I already told you that, okay, the Aryans were originally migrants from northwest of India into India. Yes. Yeah, and these people when they came into India, they came with their unique practices or spiritual system which is revolving around the fire altars. Okay, so that many or the most unique aspect of the people who came from Northwest is they were in fact okay believers in this cult of fire altar. They used to give a lot of significance to Agni, number one. Then second one is these people also converted the natural forces into gods. Okay, so, whatever natural forces they were unable to understand or scientifically explain, they used to convert them into God. Okay, so, strong winds they were afraid of. Okay, they were converted him into Varna. Thunder they were afraid of. They converted him into Indra. Sun, okay, Surya. Okay, so then this way, every natural force which is present, it was converted into one or the other God, which shares a lot of similarity to the Norse mythology of the Greeks. Okay, because the Greek gods are also there. Thor is there. He is also a thunder God. Yes, who Thor? No, Norse gods. He is also part of the Norse gods. Oh, uh, yes, yes. Okay, so it means that they all, all share the same mythology, sir. Okay, Norse means European. Okay, European mythology, Greek, okay, the, then along with that, the Norwegian mythology, all of them share similar gods. Are you following what I'm trying to say? So, this way they personified the natural gods and they converted them into natural forces into gods, number one. Then, fire altar based cult they brought into India. Then along this, so then apart from these things, okay, these people they used to have a unique language of their own. Okay, language is also very unique, and in fact, the language which was spoken by the early Vedic Aryans, okay, it has in fact been formulated in the Rig Veda, and this language it has a lot of similarities to the Indo European language group. Already in modern India, I think I talked about this. Okay, Max Muller is the one who found out this link between. Okay, the Indian languages and the European languages. He was so influenced by the Indian culture that finally he became Muller, but you remember? Okay, Max Muller. <laughs> so, the same person, he is the one who established the link between the Indian languages and the European languages. Second one. Then, apart from this, what happened is, okay, after the establishment of this Aryan invasion theory in Indian history, some prominent Indian writers and thinkers, they commented on the original homeland of Aryan, sir. And here in the Vedic literature, in the earliest part of Rig Veda, okay, people discussed about six months of day and six months of night. Okay, usually, which geographical area has six months of day and six months of night? 
the polar region, Arctic region. So, based on this evidence from the early Vedas, Balaganga Tilak, he is the one who first talked about Arctic being the original homeland of Aryans. Are you following this, sir? But Arctic seemed too far away from India. Yes, so that is the reason why the second theorist, that is Dhananda Saraswati, he proposed one more theory saying that Tibet is the original homeland of Aryans. Okay, this is better, right? Okay, because it is very nearby, you can occupy also. Okay, so saying that this is our original homeland, we come from here. Okay, so he proposed a second theory by saying that Tibet is the original homeland of Aryans, but both these theories have been disproved, sir. Okay, it has been done in the book Satyat Prakash and Balangada Tilak, he wrote a book in itself called Arctic is the original homeland of Aryans. Is it fine? But later day, the most scientifically acceptable theory is the Max Muller theory saying that so, in fact, these people, they come from this region which is known as Pontic Steppe region, which is the southern part of Russia. Okay, particularly the Caucasus mountain belt is there. Okay, so Caucasus mountain belt is present. So, between the Black Sea and Caspian Sea, there is a small region. Okay, so originally, he is the one who proposed that this Pontic Steppe region, which is present between Caspian and Black Sea, is the original homeland of Aryans. And in fact, after he proposed this theory, we find the numerous evidences for the same too. So, in fact, the Vedic Aryans while migrating from the Central Asian region to India, these people they left behind some inscriptions, sir. Okay, particularly in Iran and Iraq region, we find two inscriptions. One is called Kassite and the second one is called as Mithanite inscription. And these two inscriptions, they refer to the Vedic gods, sir. They talk about Varuna, they talk about Mitras, they talk about Indra. So, all these gods they refer to, which means that these people have migrated from this route only. Yes. Then apart from this Kassite and Mithanite inscription, one strand of Vedic Aryans, rather than coming to India from the Iran-Iraq region, they migrated to Turkey, sir. And in Turkey, we find an inscription called Bagajkai inscription. Are you understanding this? Okay, this can be asked as a good prelims question. Kassite, Mithanite and Bagajkai inscriptions, these three inscriptions, even though they are outside India, they refer to the same Vedic gods whom the Vedic Aryans used to believe to. Is it alright? Then these Aryans first they migrated to Iran region, sir. And in Iran region, they have settled down and they stayed there for quite some time. And after staying there for quite some time, the Vedic Aryans they got divided into two groups, sir. Okay, two groups they got divided into. In fact, the Aryans who settled down in Iran, okay, they used to believe in this god who is known as Ahura. Okay, he is known as Ahura or Ahura Mazda, he is known as. And based on the cult of this Ahura Mazda, the people who settled down in Iran region, they created a holy text of their own, which is known as Janda Abhisna. Even today, Parsis believe in the same concept. Yes. So, the Parsis original land is Iran region. So, these people, they settled down there and they made their god as Ahura. Okay. And the book that they have written is Jand Abhisna. But some Aryans, they were not agreeing to this text or their god, sir. So, that Aryans who did not agree to this god or text, they migrated from Iran region into the Sapta Sindhu region of India. Okay, are you following what I am trying to say? That is the reason why in the early Vedic cult, okay, you see this Ahura becoming Asura. Okay, the god of one people became the demon of others means they are in conflict with each other. Are you understanding what I am trying to say? Okay, Ahura in Iranian culture, he is god. Asura in India is Rakshasa. Are you following what I am trying to say? So, and one group of Aryans, they migrated from Iran to India and they converted Ahura into Asura, okay, and they created a new cult of their own and this cult, it got reflected in the Rigveda of India. Is it making sense? And these Aryans entry into India, the evidence is for it, it comes from 1500 BC on, sir. From 1500 BC itself, the evidences for this Vedic Aryans coming into India, it is clearly seen. Is it making sense? So, are you understanding what I am trying to say? So can you see the migratory pattern of these people from Central Asia? Then, initially when this theory was proposed, many people considered this theory to be false theory, sir. But later day, genetic studies have evolved and recently, the most recent research of, okay, this uh, Vedic Aryans and their migratory pattern, it is proved through one gene which is known as R1A1 gene, sir. Okay, this is considered to be usually the Aryan gene. And the original homeland of this Aryan gene is Central Asian steppe region itself. Okay, all the people in Central Asian said steppe region, they have the same genes. Are you following this, sir? 
Okay, then apart from that, in India, if you see, most of the, the R1A1 gene frequency, it is very high in northern part of India. Are you following this, sir? As you migrate from north to south, the frequency of this gene, it comes down. And they conducted the studies of this R1A1 gene on some skeletons which are present in Indus Valley Civilization, of which the most prominent one is Rakhi Gari woman. And this Rakhi Gari woman, she does not have the R1A1 gene. Are you following this, sir? This proves very clearly that, okay, the people from Central Asia, through genetic studies, it is proven now, okay, that they have migrated from Central Asia, okay, through Iran into India. And after that, okay, they mainly spread out in northern parts of India. It doesn't, it means that their frequency of this gene is higher in northern part of India. Are you understanding what I'm trying to say? Okay, but it doesn't mean that there is complete absence of R1A1 gene in South India. It is present. But the frequency is less when compared to North India. It means that for 1000 people in North India, okay, you find 900 genes of R1A1. But in South, if you come, okay, you reduce it to 300, 400. Okay, a lot of mixing has happened, but in the mixing too, okay, we can see that the frequency is higher in North when compared to South. Are you understanding the emergence of Aryans into India, how they came into India? So, R1A1 gene is one evidence, then Kassite, Mithanite and Bhagajkai inscriptions. Then language similarity between Indian language, that is Sanskrit and the Indo-European group of languages is one more link. Then Jand Avastha and its Asura or Ahura becoming Asura in Rigveda. All of these are clear, sir. Is it making sense? So this way, okay, the Vedic Aryans slowly, gradually they entered into India. And the initial settlements of the early Vedic Aryans in India, they are present in, okay, the Sapta Sindhu region, which is the Indus River and it's a five tributaries, sir. Okay, there is six rivers plus Saraswati. So, in total, seven rivers, okay, are Sapta Sindhu rivers. Is it clear? Indus plus five tributaries of Indus. Then, along with that, the Saraswati river, all seven rivers are together known as Sapta Sindhu rivers. And in this delta region, they started settling down, sir. And the Vedic Aryans, when they came into India, so first and foremost, we will study their polity, okay, society and economy. Is it all right? Okay. So, when it comes to the polity of these people, primarily, the Vedic Aryans are pastoralist by nature. Okay, pastoralist means they are animal, okay, rearing is their main activity, sir. Pastoralism is around which their economy is to revolve around. Is it clear? Number one. Number two is, apart from pastoralism, these people were also, they in fact tamed horse, okay, but in Indus Valley Civilization, we find very slight evidence of horses here and there, but no prominent evidence of horse is present in Indus Valley Civilization. Once or twice, they have imported some horses into India. Are you following what I'm trying to say? Okay, you might have seen this uh, movie of Hrithik Roshan on Indus Valley Civilization, Mohanjadar, so in which he is shown as a tamer of horses. Okay, only a few evidences of horses are present, not prominent. It is the Vedic Aryans who brought horses in large number into India. Is it fine? Second one. Third one is, these are the people who, in fact, constructed the chariots with horses. Okay, don't think of the Vedic Aryans as horse riders. Okay, they are not horse riders, sir. They are the people who, in fact, Attach the horse into a cart. Okay, the cart is a spoked wheel cart. Okay, they never used to ride the horses independently. Okay, riding of horses, it emerged later during the time of foreign ruling groups' invasions over India. Before that, there is no horse riding in India. Let me be very clear about it. These people, they came on spoked wheel cart horse chariots, but not on, okay, horses themselves. Is it making sense? Okay, because riding a horse is a very, very difficult thing. It needs some peculiar equipment, sitting poster also, also required in order to ride a horse. These people did not develop the technology, they came with a spoked wheel horse cart. Sir. Is it alright? Then apart from this, by this the time they are present in Central Asia itself, they mastered the okay, art of iron. Okay, iron is one thing which they have derived when they were present in Central Asia itself. And in early Vedic period itself, they have used iron for the sake of weapons. Okay, weapons is one thing which they used the iron for. Then along with that, any society which is pastoral, it will be nomadic. Because pastoralism may, okay, so pasture is very important. And in all seasons, you don't find pastures in all places, right? So that is the reason why these people were primarily nomadic by nature. And these people, apart from being nomadic, okay, the Vedic Aryans were in fact segregated into tribes 
which are known as janas okay jana here means tribe okay jana jana means tribe is a group of people who are numbering more than 100 is known as jana so jana is one thing then apart from jana one more important thing about the vedic aryans is get the vedic aryan polity it revolves around five different kinds of tribal assemblies this is very very important so just check the tribal assemblies which are present one is sabha second one is samiti third one is vidatha fourth one is gana and fifth one is can you check the tribal assemblies of uh, these people sabha samiti vidatha gana and parishad yes five five different assemblies used to be there in fact sabha is the council of elders okay, it's given there just check it once sabha is the council of elders and its primary function is judicial functions okay so the second one is samiti samiti is the general assembly of all people in the society and in samiti okay so listen to this carefully samiti may the most important part is all the tribal members used to participate and its sole function is election of rajan i told you that rajan used to be elected in early vedic period so election of rajan is done through samiti that is the second one third one is vidatha vidatha is war council or economic council sir war council okay vidatha is in fact war council when the tribe wanted to fight against another tribe these people used to organize this war assembly or war council which is known as vidatha that is the third one fourth one is this council which is known as gana okay gana is for a religious council okay then the last one is parishad parishad is an economic council okay economic council may okay what they used to do is they used to redistribute the resources among the tribe is it making sense so five different kinds of councils used to be there and the elected king is called Rajan and he is elected usually on the basis of merit but not on the basis of heredity. Okay, merit based election used to be present and the primary purpose of Rajan is to protect the entire okay, Jana from any foreign attack sir. Is it making sense? Am I understandable sir? And for his services usually the Rajan is paid a tax which is known as Bali. That is also a voluntary offering to the king. It is not couple sir. Huh? Bhaga, yes, uh, yes, not Bali. It is called as Bhaga. Bhaga is the voluntary offering to the king, okay, which is paid by the tribe. It means that there will be no force involved. Okay, I like the services of the king. So, whatever I can, I will contribute it to the king. He cannot demand anything. And the king does not have any political institution of its own. No political institution. No military is also present for the king. Whenever a war comes, he used to go to every family, request them for soldiers, and with those soldiers, he used to defend the village. Sir. In fact, Rajan is the primary servant of the entire Jana. That is how usually the civil servants also should be there. Okay, primary servant of the society is, okay, they should be. And Rajan is in fact the primary servant of the society. Are you following what I am trying to say? So then apart from this, okay, what happened is during the early Vedic period in polity, okay, the most important asset for the entire society is cow, sir. Okay, the entire society used to revolve around cow. Okay, primarily because they are pastoral society and their dietary pattern is also very much revolving around the cow, sir. Primarily milk, okay, and it's a derivative products they used to use in food. Then apart from that, they only used to consume barley, which is a freely, okay, growing across India. In many parts, barley is freely growing. They were not knowing agriculture. They did not know agriculture. They did not practice agriculture. They were in fact just collecting the barley, which is growing freely across India. And with the barley, they used to cook their food. But their main source of food and income is always cow. That is the reason why cow is given a lot of significance in the early Vedic texts. Is it making sense? So then apart from that, in polity of early Vedic period, okay, so there is no state, no king. Okay, then apart from that, usually the assets of the society are collectively owned. Okay, there was no private property or conception of private property. And here, in the polity of the early Vedic Aryans, the tribe or jana is a very, very important institution, sir. Then apart from Jana, usually the tribal assemblies, oh sorry, I will talk about it in society separately. So this is the political structure. Now shall we, shall I move to the society? Yes. So listen to this sir. When it comes to the society, so the early Vedic period, it is associated with formulation of the Veda, Brahmana, okay, Aranyaka and Upanishad. In fact, every Veda, it contains four parts to it sir. Okay, this is important, Veda, Brahmana, Aranyaka and Upanishad. So, every Veda has four parts to it. If I say Rig Veda, it has its associated Brahmanas, Aranyakas and Upanishads. So, this way the Vedic literature, it contained all of them. And 
okay when it comes to the society the most unique aspect of the society here is the term aryan means a person who is having noble birth okay it is a person who is having a noble birth okay it is not a racial type okay it is in fact a classification of a person who is having noble birth is known as aryan is it clear okay and here the aryans were primarily a language group but not a racial group but not a racial group it means that all the aryans don't belong to the same race sir. are you understanding what i'm trying to say it is primarily a language group but not a racial group but within the aryans these people initially used to classify the aryans into two groups one is called shweta varna the second one is known as krishna varna aryans mein hi do type the okay shweta varna aryan and krishna varna aryan okay shweta varna means naturally shweta means white in color Yes or no? In Sanskrit, Shweta means white. Okay, whereas Krishna means dark colored. Yes. So within the Aryans, there are two groups of Aryans. One is Shweta Varna Aryan, second one is Krishna Varna Aryan. Are you following this, sir? Whereas the local people who were present during the time of Vedic Aryans, they were in fact called as Dasyus. Okay, Dasyu. Okay, Dasyu are usually the called as slave, right? Yes, so the local population, they were given the derogatory term of Dasyu. Are you following this, sir? Okay, Dasyu, Sweta Varna, Krishna Varna and Aryan is the person with noble birth and it is a language group. It is not a racial group. Are you following what I am trying to say? Please remember this very clearly. Aryan is a language group but not a racial group. All the Aryans are not of the same race. There used to be black colored Aryans and fair colored Aryans. Two types used to be there. And the Aryan immigration into India it did not occur in one go, sir. In fact, it occurred for nearly hundreds of years, year on year. Some groups of people they used to continuously migrate here. Is it fine? Then, along with that, in the Rigveda, okay, in the later okay compositions of Rigveda, usually Rigveda is considered to have in total 1028 okay, separate hymns. Okay, 1028 is the number of hymns which are present. And these 1028 hymns, they are classified into 10 mandalas. Sir. Okay, mandala means chapter here. Okay, they are classified into 10 mandalas. Mein 1028 hymns are present. And of these hymns, the most prominent one is present in the 10th mandala. Okay, which is known as the Purusha Sukta. Okay, Purusha Sukta hymn is the most prominent hymn here in early Vedic period. And this Purusha Sukta hymn is the one which is responsible for formulation of okay, the Varna system in India, not caste. Caste is different, Varna is different. Okay, Varna system is formulated here. Varna is okay, different, it has Vedic origin. Caste is in fact Jati. Okay, jati is different, Varna is different. Sir. Even though the Jati derives from the Varna system, Jati and Varna are not the same. Because Varnas are only Whereas jatis are innumerable jatis are present. Okay, right now the socio-economic caste census people they are hitting their head, not, not able to understand which caste is what. That is what is known as jati. Whereas varnas are only four in number. Are you understanding? Recently in Bihar there was a major controversy when transgender was converted into a caste. Are you reading the newspapers? Kabi kabi sir, man lagta hai to kar lete. So, Naito, usually we don't read, okay, but sometimes it might happen, okay, by chance. Okay, up road page, ja suddenly a paper dig gaya aapko. I say, you take a Okay, now let me see this, okay. So, this is known as Purusha Sukta Him, and here there are four Varnas Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra. Okay, usually it is uh, in fact considered to be a sacrifice in which, uh, okay, the Brahman, okay, or the original god of Vedic Aryans, okay, he sacrificed himself and in the sacrifice from the head of the uh, Brahman, okay, the Brahmins have emerged, then from his shoulders the Kshatriyas have emerged, from his thighs the Vaishyas have emerged, from his feet the Shudras have emerged. Is it alright? And every Varna is given its own role in society. Okay, the Brahmins are supposed to do intellectual work, Kshatriyas are supposed to do the physical protection of the kingdom. Then the Vaishyas are supposed to, in fact, perform pastoralism, sir. Here there is no trade. It is originally a pastoralist caste. Whereas the Shudra's function is to serve all the three upper Varnas. This was the theoretical classification which has been provided in 
Purusha Sukta. Even though the Rigveda Purusha Sukta contains this fourfold classification, here during early Vedic period there is clear cut evidence to prove us that Varna in early Vedic period it is not fixed on the basis of birth. Sir. It is not fixed on the basis of birth, but okay, it is in fact fixed on the basis of aptitude of a person. Okay, in fact, when I was talking about Dan and Saraswati, I talked about this. Go back to Vedas, you remember? Okay, Varna is fixed on the basis of aptitude, but not on the basis of birth. In fact, in early Vedic society, there are clear evidences from Rigveda saying that in the same family, the father is a Kshatriya, the mother is a Shudra. Whereas, the son is a Brahman. Are you getting what I am trying to say? So, it means that what, okay, so the people who, based on their capability, they are getting into different professions. Are you understanding this? So, there is a flexibility concept in Varna. And along with that, in early Vedic period, Varna is not hierarchical, sir. They are just different groups in society, but not placed in any particular order. Are you understanding what I am trying to say? Okay, this is the second aspect of Varna system which was present during early Vedic period Rigveda. Okay, Varna is based on aptitude, that is 10th mandala. Then, oh, sorry, Varna is based on aptitude but not on the basis of birth. And the second one is Varna is not hierarchical at this point of time. See, first color classification later became, okay, this classification and this classification is considered to be occupational classification, sir. Are you understanding this? Yeah, occupational classification means based on the profession of a person, his varna is fixed. Color classification to occupational classification, it has shifted. Is it all right? Then along with that, during the early Vedic period, the unique aspect of early Vedic period is, okay, even though the society is patriarchal, patri-local and patri-linear, okay, so it is very different from, okay, the <coughs> system of Indus Valley civilization, patriarchy means power domination of men, then patri-local, that is after marriage, wife has to migrate. And patri-lineal, that means property flows through male members of the family. Yes, but even though it is patriarchal, in fact, in Vedic society, women were very free, sir. Women were very free. In fact, most of the marriages which were conducted for women, they were post-puberty marriages. There was no concept of child marriage there. One. Second one is, there is permission for widow remarriage, which is known as niyoga. Niyoga is permitted in early Vedic period, wherein... After the death of the husband of the wife, she can be married to his brother, sir. Are you following this? This is what is known as Niyoga concept. It was present in early Vedic period. Then, the Sati which is practiced during early Vedic period, it is symbolic but not actual Sati. You remember I told about Raja Ramon Rai proving this? Yes, that saying that based on the early Vedic scriptures, in Sati, okay, what happens is some rituals will be conducted by making the wife sit on husband's funeral pyre. Then after that, she is asked to come down and then only it is lift, lit. Remember? Okay, that is what is called as symbolic sati. But by later Vedic period, it got converted into actual sati. After ritual, they burned the wife along with the husband. Yes, so it was only symbolic sati here. Then along with that, there was no concept of endogamy here, sir. Okay, varna endogamy means what? That people of one varna, they should marry among themselves. Yes, but there is express permission for people of one varna to marry to the people of other Varna and this is known as Pratiloma and Anuloma marriages. Sir. Anuloma marriages are the marriages where a upper caste or upper Varna man got gets married to a lower Varna woman, then it is known as Anuloma marriage. Pratiloma, Prati means opposite, right? Opposite means, okay, upper Varna woman, she gets married to a lower Varna man, then it is known as Pratiloma marriage. Is it making sense? So, all of these are permitted here. No child marriage is present. Okay, and in fact, women used to participate in all the tribal assemblies except for Sabha. Sir. Sabha is the judicial council in which women are not permitted. And in all other councils, women used to play a very important role. And many of the Rigvedic verses were originally drafted by women. Sir. In fact, there were some famous poets of early Vedic period, particularly Lopamudra, Apala, okay, Vishwavara and uh, one more lady is there. So, four people, four women, they composed many verses of the Rigveda. But later day, women were denied permission to read the Veda. But originally, some of the verses are written by women themselves. Are you following this, sir? So, this way, women used to play an equal position in society they used to have. Okay, So, this way, the society was in fact very egalitarian and it, there was no discrimination against people and there was just an occupational classification and this is a, in fact a very good time to be in 
That is the reason why Dayanand Saraswati, he wanted to take India back to the early Vedic society, sir. Go back to Vedas, you remember? Okay, so the, why he gave this call? Because this society is a very good society to live in. That is the reason why he gave a call for go back to Vedas. And here, one more important thing about the early Vedic period is, in society, there is no concept of idolatry. Idolatry, idol-based worship is not present. In fact, the religion of the early Vedic Aryans, it used to revolve around the fire altar. Sir. Are you following this? So, fire altar based worship, okay, all the worship is based on fire altar and sacrifice. Is it making sense? So, this is the society of early Vedic period and the last part is economy. Already we talked about pastoralism, yes. So, no agriculture, badly. So, trade and commerce is based on barter, but not on the basis of, okay, any exchange, okay. But sometimes, these people, the early Vedic Aryans, they started using okay, these things which are known as Nishaka and Satamanasa. Okay, Nishaka is gold coin, Satamana is silver coin. Okay, so Satamana is also known as Krishnala. Okay, Krishnala also is a silver coin. Krishnala or Satamana is a silver coin. Gold coin is known as Nishaka. Is it making sense? All right. So, shall we, shall I have a quick run through the handout because you will miss again the points, okay. So, let us have a quick run through the handout. Okay. So, in fact, can you see the Vedic Aryans, okay, coming down, okay. So, they have spoke wheel, chariot drawn by horses, okay. So, this is artistic recreation, okay. So, and uh, the initial area of settlement is this, sir, early Vedic Aryans. Okay, no prominent site, okay, only the area we know about. Because these are pastoralists, they did not set up any city of their own or town. they came from the region of Afghanistan. Yes, naturally, they have to come from Afghanistan. Okay, because they, in the Iran say, they have to move and they come to Bactria, that is Afghanistan. And from Bactria, they come into India. Is it alright? Through the passes which are present in Afghanistan. Okay, they have been able to come into India. So, in fact, their pottery is black and red pottery. Okay, black and red pottery is the characteristic pottery, formative phase of Indian polity, established by migratory band of people called Aryan. Is it clear? Okay, Aryans are the migratory band of people. Aryan is a person of noble birth. It is a linguistic classification or language group, but not a racial classification. All the Aryans are not the same race. Okay, listen to me very carefully. This is very important. Don't get confused. Okay, Aryans are just a language group of people who belong to different, different races. Even some fact, some Mediterraneans, some Central Asians, all of them are Aryans primarily because they spoke the same language. Is it all right? So now just see this. So Balangadhar Tilak studied the early Vedic period which says six months day and six months night, wrote a book called Arctic is the home of Veda. Okay, so then Dayan and Saraswati Satyat Prakash book, Tibet is the origin of Aryans, but disproved finally Max Muller, Aryans are Eurasian stock of people, studies on languages called comparative philology, I think I talked about comparative philology before, okay, if you study languages in comparison, then it is known as comparative philology, okay, I think I told about it in modern India, yes or no, when I was talking about Orientalists, I talked about this, okay, then proved European languages and Sanskrit have common origin. Okay, so, and he calls them as Indo-European group of languages. And later day, Bagajkai inscription in Turkey, Kassite and Mithanite inscriptions in Iraq, Iraq belt, all the three refer to the same Aryan gods. Is it all right? Then Jand Avesta, the sacred script of Zoroastrianism, God is Ahura Mazda. Okay, and in early Vedic period, evil is called as Asura. So, in fact, the start of the Vedic culture is based on a conflict here. Yes or no? In fact, this person Amartya Sen in the book called Argumentative Indian, he gives a lot of significance to this, saying that it is through discord only the Vedic culture has started, okay, through argumentation, through uh, inability to compromise with others only the civilization has started, okay. even though it is not a wrong thing. Okay, So, you do not agree with others, so you part ways and you start your own culture. Are you getting this? Okay, so geographical area is Indus Valley, Saptasindhu region. Vedic Aryans did not know about seas. This is very important. They did not know about seas. Okay, usually they used to call the large lakes which are present as Samudra. 
but they did not know about the seas because they never touched a ocean till the time they came into India. Okay, they came from Central Asia directly. Okay, migratory band of people they did not know about the seas. Gave elaborate description about some mountains of Himalayan region. Okay, particularly okay a mountain which is known as Mozawat. Okay, it's given there, right? Okay, so you can write it down. Mozawat. Okay, in fact, it is considered to be the origin for or the source for a drug which is known as soma. Okay, it is a hallucinogenic uh, drug. Okay, which made the Aryans. Uh, okay, in fact, uh, okay, have some kind of spiritual trances. Okay, spiritual trance. Soma, soma, soma pana. It is called as. Okay, Mozavat. They discussed particularly about this Mozavat, okay, which is the origin for soma. In fact, in the Rig Veda, the most sacred text of Hinduism, one entire mandala is dedicated to soma. Are you understanding this, sir? Okay, so it is a hallucinogenic drug. Okay, but uh, we don't know uh, which drug is this. Okay, we don't know which drug is this. Okay, but most of the early Vedic saints who used to write their compositions, they used to do it in the influence of Somapana. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Okay, so that is the case. So Mausavat Soma. Okay, so then next one is. Uh, see, okay, this is one. Uh, 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 map of this uh, uh, Vedic Aryan sir. So, in fact, uh, they started from the Black Sea Caspian Sea belt. Okay, so from the here, one band it migrated to okay Europe, one band it migrated to India, sir. Okay, that is the reason why there is similarity in language. Mm -hmm. Are you understanding this? Okay, the names of which tribes went there, where is not very important for us, just in order to show the map, I am showing it. Okay, Central Asian corridor say some people migrated to Iran from Iran. Okay, some people they directly came into India. Is it all right? Okay, so then R1A1 Aryan gene is it given there? I think it is given there. R1A1 is called as Aryan gene and Rakhi Gadi women dead body R1A1 gene is completely absent. R1A1 genes original homeland is Pontic Steppe region between Black Sea and Caspian Sea. Okay, this is called as the Aryan gene. Then administrative system. Low evolution of monarchy and autocratic rules. Five different assemblies were present. Rajan is his primary purpose is protection. Paid by voluntary tax called bhaga by the people. No association with political institutions. Does not have any military associations of his own. No political institution, no military. Okay, the only associate of the Rajan is Purohit. Write it down. Okay, so Rajan is associated with Purohit. Okay. Purohit, okay, Purohit. Main associate of Rajan is Purohit. Okay, Purohit is the associate. Then they have used to have assemblies like, okay, just listen to this: Sabha, Samiti, Gana, Vidata, and Parishad. Okay, so the pur purpose of each assembly I have talked about. This can be asked as a very good prelims question, right? Yes, they can phrase a very good question, prelims question around this, sir. Sabha is the judicial council. Samiti is the general assembly, Gana is cultural and religious functions, Vidata is role in war, Parishad is gay economy. Is it clear? So each council it had its own function. Varna system emerged from 10 mandalas of early Vedic period. So and there was an alliance between Brahmana and Kshatriya it started. So I just now I talked about the Rajan Purohita link right. So that formed the basis for the Brahman Kshatriya alliance. More about it I will discuss later. Then women participated in all assemblies except Sabha. Okay, so and one prominent political event during the early Vedic period, I forgot to tell about this. After discussing this, we will wind up the class, sir. I think some people have some other commitments also. Yes. So, is it good for me to extend the class a little bit? Okay, so I think some people have some reservations, but at least try to come sharp at 8, sir. Okay, because there is a lot many things that I need to discuss. Art and culture and ancient and medieval India is a large section. Okay, so that is the reason why try to come early. Okay, eight 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 means eight sharp. Okay, today morning I started the class roughly around eight fifty. Okay, that should not be the case. So let's uh, try and uh, meet early tomorrow. So the last topic is one last war, sir. During the early Vedic period, the most prominent political event is a war called the Sarajanya War, which forms the basis for the Mahabharata. Okay, the base story of early Vedic period that is Dasarajanya war, it in fact inspires the okay the Mahabharata warfare, sir. Is it all right? 
So, in fact, this Dhatarajanya war is fought between Bharatas and Purus. Okay, two tribes are present. Bharatas is one and the second tribe is Purus. In fact, the Purus, they formed an alliance with 10 different tribes and with their Guru. Okay, the Guru of these Purus is Vishwamitra. Okay, with the, the alliance with Vishwamitra, these people, they formed into a union and they wanted to destroy this tribe called Bharatas. And the king of Bharatas is a person called Sudasa and the Guru, Raj Guru of this Sudasa is this person called Vasista. You know, Vasista Vishwamitra, two prominent sages of Indian mythology. So, in fact, this Vasista in alliance with Sudatha, okay, even though their military is weak, they were able to destroy this 10 rulers or 10 kings alliance. Sir. Are you following this? And the war, it primarily started over the river water of Parushni. Okay, Parushni is nothing but today's Ravi river. Okay, Ravi is there, right? So, it is called, then called as Parshni. For the river water of this Parshni river, these two kingdoms, they fought against each other. And in this war, okay, Bharatas, they emerged victorious. And after emerging victorious, they merged the Bharata clan with the Purus and they created a new clan called Kuru clan. Sir. Okay, Kuru clan they created. So, and in fact, this is, this Kuru clan later became very prominent in uh, the Mahabharata of India. Yes or no? Kuru clan mehi, Pandavas and Kauravas, both of them belong to the clan called Kuru clan. Okay, so and we, in fact, the name of India that is Bharat. Okay, did I tell about this? Yes. So, one reason for the name of Bharat is this tribe which is known as Bharatas in early Vedic period. That is one reason. Okay, second reason is, okay, the name Bharata, it also comes from a very, very prominent play of India. You might be knowing about this play called uh, Abhignana Shakuntala. Okay, so in fact, Shakuntala's son is Bharata, who became the ruler of India. So, the second influence on the name Bharata, it comes from the Bharata Varsha, which was started by this uh, son of Shakuntala, second reason. So, these are the two indigenous reasons for naming India as Bharat, sir. Okay, whereas the India, the term India, it is not, in fact, indigenous in origin. Okay, in fact, India is originally called as Sindhon. Okay, Sindhon is the name. And it is the name which has been given to Indians by the Arabs, sir. Arabs started calling the people who are living to the east of Indus River as Sindhus. And this Sindhu later became Hindu. And from that, the name of India, it comes. Is it making sense? So, the name of India, it has foreign origin. Bharata has indigenous origin to India. Okay, that is the reason why in the Constituent Assembly of India, there is a big conflict to name India, sir. Okay, whether to call it as India or Bharat. Finally, they made a compromise and called it as India, that is Bharat. Okay, following this, okay, the origin of the name Bharat, okay, so one is this Bharatas of early Vedic period. Second one is the Bharata who is the son of Shakuntala and Dushanta of Abhignana Shakuntala. Okay, so and one more traditional name that is given to Indian subcontinent in Vedas is the Jambu Dvipa. Okay, it's also called as Jambu Dvipa. Okay, if you want, you can write it down. So, Jambu Dvipa, Bharata and Jambu Dvipa. Dvipa means island. Okay, Jambu means large. Okay, Jambu Dvipa is also one more name that is given to India. So, on this note, let us wind up the session for today. Okay, tomorrow let us meet sharp at 8. Okay, we have uh, many things pending to be discussed. Okay, we will do it uh, properly. Okay, so same style sir, but take the printouts of the handouts. One request from my side. Okay, please take the printouts. It will ease your preparation. So that you can write it then and there itself. So from second handout, you take the printout. Okay. So that's it. Thank you for your time. Have a good day.